on, you together. cannot give him that. Slim no, Heroes no, games. no, no. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, Chris, and Nick named their favorite episodes of 2017 and their personal games of the year. Plus, Cuphead, The Last Guardian, in 2017, the year in haiku. Backwardcompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 119 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Nick. Hello. And today we're doing our year in review of 2017. This is a uh, beginning of the year tradition for us here at the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. We always like to open up the year with a year in review, and then the next episode will be our traditional look ahead to 2018. Um, Am I in the future? (laughs) Maybe. That's awesome. For all you people listening to this in 2016, um, yes, this is the future. <laughs> it's not much better. <laughs> Don't uh, stop blowing my mind. I, I won't even go into social media's opinion of 2017. Yeah, anyway. No. <laughs> but let's just say it, it trumps 2016. <laughs> Uh, um, I like it. I like uh, what you did uh, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what? But um, what? <laughs> we're going to be uh, going through our personal games of the year. We'll be defining what we mean by those. And then we'll also be talking about what our top episodes of the year were from uh, the past year of the backward com podcast. Uh, but before we do that, we have some opening segments for you, Wait, including... Were we actually supposed to just talk about our, be- our favorite episodes of this show? Yes. I brought in my favorite oh. episodes of SpongeBob. Crap. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I did too. I, I thought we were doing SpongeBob. Well, I thought it was Star Thanks for Wars, listening, so. guys. <laughs> <laughs> so Doc and I will be finishing out the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, in preparation for our um, Game of the Year segment, I actually wanted to make sure that I was able to play a couple of the bigger games of the year that I missed out on. Um, and those two games were Super Mario Odyssey, which I did not have a chance to play, but the other was Cuphead, which I did have a chance to play. And um, I, unfortunately, I don't own an Xbox One, nor do I have much desire to get one. And my PC currently is, is broken, so I didn't get Cuphead because I didn't think I could run it on my laptop. Well, turns out I can. Um, on a whim, I bought it off of Steam and thought, if it doesn't work, I'll just try to get a Steam refund. It worked, works just fine. Hmm. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the game, which I actually enjoyed quite a bit. So Cuphead is uh, was developed and published by Studio MDHR, um, and they're an indie game studio, and they got a lot of attention for this game when it was first announced, and one of the reasons for that was the production values. So the game looks like a 1930s cartoon from, say, the like from Fletcher or from Walt Disney back in that era. The cells were individually hand-drawn, right? I am not 100% sure, but I think so. Okay, so during dev, there was at least a rumor yeah. that that was true. I've heard that too, but I'm not, I did not actually research it to see I if actually, it actually is true. I saw a, um, a talk done by one of the artists uh, at GDC, and he actually went through his animation process for a few of the enemies, and it looked like it was all hand That's amazing. Hand drawn. It, yeah. certainly amazing. Looks, it certainly looks it. And, it, and that's, that's the thing that I wanted to talk mainly about in the game, is that the, the visuals are spot on to the era. It's wow. incredible. It's one of those things where when you're a kid, and, and Doc, you can probably um, sympathize with this. And I'm not, not sure about that person, old. Nick. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, when, when you're a kid and you're, you're, you get your first video game and you, you see you know, the rudimentary graphics and you're yeah, thinking, yeah. and then you see like a television show or a cartoon and you're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could play a cartoon? Yeah. This, you are playing a cartoon and not an abstraction of a cartoon it's directly, and that's a certain era of cartoon. It looks and feels like an actual. But it looks actual... and feels and sounds. All the sound effects, oh, wow. the music, everything. It is a gorgeous game to look at, a gorgeous game to hear, and it's actually a lot of fun to play. Now, that being said, let me talk a little bit about the gameplay. So, 
And I actually, I went into this game thinking it was always going to, it was going to be an arcade like experience where you're ru- running from level to Running level. gun, yeah. That's not what it is. No. Actually. It's, really? It's, so what they do is they have this, first they give you a storybook in, um, intro. And I do mean literally, it's a storybook. <laughs> and you, you read the story and they show, as the music plays, of course, like, you know, the 1930s kind of cartoon music. And it talks about uh, Cuphead and Mug and Mugman, which are the two characters in the game. And you can play local co-op, by the way. You can, it's a two-player game if you want to play it that way. And they've, they are in a casino and they're betting everything. And they think they're so good that they make a deal. Essentially, they bet the devil their souls. Mm. And, of course, they lose. So they're about the devil's going to take their souls, and they manage to strike a deal with him. He has there's a bunch of a bunch of people that are kind of holding out on him, and he needs to go collect their souls. And he doesn't want to do it, so he's going to let Cuphead and Mugman do it. So they agree to go out and get you know souls from collect souls from all these people, and the people that are collecting the souls from are the bosses of the game, which you have to defeat. So when you start the game. First, you're you're inside just kind of a you know a cabin, and you're able to do this tutorial sequence, which I did because I just wanted to get a real quick understanding of the controls, which is a good idea because it's not a complicated game, but it is a difficult game. So a lot of it because it's very it's very run and gun, and a lot of boss fights as part of the very game. Very twitchy. Um, it is yes. Um, it's it's a lot. It's essentially you. You can control different things about your character in terms of the type of bullets that you're shooting, the rate that you fire, things like that. You can buy different upgrades. Um, you can buy you know, other upgrades for using your special and things like that. So you start on a world map, kind of, kind of reminiscent of, say, like Mario 3, something like that, mm-hmm. only there's no lines connecting it. It's like a free roam overhead world map. And you get to select your level that way. So you choose what level that you play and what order you play them. However, certain parts of the map are blocked off, and you have to unlock them by beating certain levels. Oh, okay. And as you're going through, each level, you have a choice between playing it on simple or normal difficulty. And in simple difficulty, it doesn't actually play through the full final form of the boss. You only get to see the first two forms if it's a boss fight. If it's a run and gun level, I think you you skip part of the run and gun level. I haven't experienced that. I, I did try it on both to kind of play around with it for the, some of the boss levels. But you also don't capture their soul. So you can't capture their soul if you beat it on simple. Oh. So you can unlock more of the map and you can continue and continue in the game, but you'll never be able to 100% the game. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about the levels. The, they have three different kinds that I've experienced so far. They have the run and gun style, which is um, little, you know, you're in, you're in an area, you have to move as quickly as you can, and a, and a bunch of enemies will, you know, fall from the sky or come up from the ground, shoot things at you, you know, whatever. And you have to basically, it's like a platformer segment where you're, you're running, you're jumping, you're shooting, you're trying to avoid them. And you're just trying to get to the end of the level. It's like a finger gun, right? Yes, you have a finger gun. Yeah, it's really cool. (laughs) Um, And you have a special that you can do as well. Um, And you can, and your special uses uses up little cards, essentially like playing cards. Hmm. And you earn more by surviving longer without getting hit. You only can take a few hits, like, and um, it's three hits is unless you get an upgrade that lets you take one extra hit. You can only get hit three times in the whole level. Or you have to start the whole thing over again. Oh, wow. So it's like very old style yeah. um, difficulty for a game. So that's the run and gun style. Um, all of them have that difficulty. I mean, the, the, the three hit restriction. The, then there's the boss level, kind of a boss rush, where you're trying to capture a soul. And, for example, one of them um, was like this giant plant. And so it has three different forms. And one of the forms, it might be like a, a crying onion or something. And it's like an onion that's cr- literally crying, and you have to avoid the, like, tears and shoot it until it transforms into its next phase. And then you have to beat that phase. And then if you beat that phase, you have to beat the third phase, and then you essentially beat the boss, and you Mm -hmm. capture its soul. And then the third type of level is similar to the run and gun, and they have a boss variant of it too. But instead of being um, running on on the ground, you're actually in a small airplane. And the controls are slightly different. So you're still shooting in the airplane, but you have a special uh, shrink button where you can shrink the airplane into a very, really small version of itself so you can help you can avoid larger projectiles oh, and enemies will come at you but your um, rate of fire and how far you can fire is a lot smaller so it's really more for like avoidance as opposed to you can't really play that way the whole time um so going through the game um one i learned a couple of things so one 
I learned that I have a lot more patience for difficult games than I thought I did. Because <laughs> I haven't played games like a game like that in a while, and it can get pretty tough. I mean, it can get really frustrating. I mean, I was stuck on one of the bosses for, must have replayed that level maybe eight or nine times where you have to face um, one of these ghost bosses that eventually you kill it, and then it comes back as a giant like gravestone that will literally like crush you and fall on top of you. <laughs> it's really annoying. Like it starts with this weird like blobby thing that just bounces around and like annoyingly bounces off off of the side of the screen and then tries to hit you. And then to like a little gravestone thing that tries to fall on you. But I must have played that like eight, nine times, that full level all the way through until I beat it. Um, so if you die in the boss you have to start at the beginning of the level? Yes, but mm-hmm. the but the boss levels are actually it's just the boss. Oh, okay. So it's like a run and gun is one type of level. Oh. The boss is one type of level, and the flying is one type of level, but there's like a boss variant of the That's kind of interesting. I, I yeah. like that design. And you get to choose. You could go, okay, I don't want to do this. This one's too hard. I'm going to go over here and do this other instead. And you can earn extra power-ups. Like there's people that are just standing around. You can talk to them. They might give you an extra bonus card that you could spend in like a shop to buy new, to like outfit your character because you can, you can outfit yourself and give yourself say, oh, I want to, I want to, um, have one extra life, but I'm going to shoot my, my shots will be a little weaker or, um, I want my gun to be, um, you know, extra rapid fire or something. So you have like these little bonuses that you can get or like that, that it's actually kind of adds a little, a little bit of an extra, um, RPG element to it. Very minor, Mm -hmm. but, um, there's, there's a lot more depth to the game than I expected is sort of what I'm getting at. So it's a lot of fun. It's a good game. And I think just production value alone and the fact that it's a um, $20 game when it's not on sale, and it does go on sale on Steam um, quite often. So I do recommend it. Well, I got Last Guardian for Christmas. Oh, It's a game that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. But Years, I right? Well, uh, sort of. It, it depends. I mean, I found out that it was coming out probably five or six years ago when it was very first announced. Uh, then they waited long enough that a new console came out. We call it the PS4. And they adjusted some things and uh, other things happened. And people came, you know, it, it came out. People played it. They complained that it felt like a PS3 game on PS4, which makes sense. Um, and there was also this element uh, sort of agreed upon element if you will that it was just sort of this mashup between shadow of the colossus and uh ico shadow of the ico ico if you prefer um shadow of our former selves all of that is valid i just i want to say that all of that is valid it was also exactly what i was looking for um so it really felt to me like the the next spiritual successor it had all the the things that I enjoyed about those other games, exploring a castle, trying to escape, um, having a companion, uh, climbing on a big thing, having the puzzle elements, all of that stuff. It's It's got just the right amount of, of call it Zelda in it. Um, and yet you don't even have a weapon. You don't have a stick. You don't have anything like that. There are not really any enemies, at least not at the part I'm at. And it's more of an environmental kind of escape thing. The thing I oh, love... So, so there's no combat at all? Not really, no. Huh. Well, at least not for the first few hours. Because there was in, in um, obviously, Shadow of the Colossus, but even in Ico. Right. Or yeah, Ico, oh, in Ico, or Ico definitely was, because yeah. you were battling the shadow creatures right. and everything. Uh, so, disclaimer, I'm only a couple of hours in, um, and, and mo- for the most part, it's been about trying to get uh, my, my giant... Uh, dog, pony dragon, whatever we he is. We call him a puppy dragon. Yeah. Oh, that works. Puppy yeah. dragon. Uh, my, my son, Ian, who is three, also calls him a dragon. So he actually <laughs> loves watching me play this game. Um, it looks beautiful. At least from the, the, the videos that I've seen, it looks really nice. Well, and that's the thing. Um, it's it's very stylized, mm. but I think it actually made the, the translation over to PS4 just fine. Um, they came out with a, like a digitally enhanced version of the other two, and I played those. And so that's kind of where my memory is on those now, and it's what I expected. And it's fine. Now, there there are some minor problems. I would call them gameplay problems. Um, whenever you, you jump up onto the feather fur of your uh, dog, Pony Dragon, uh, <laughs> puppy, pu- dragon. puppy Dragon, um, you, you can find yourself in weird positions, like uh, inside of his la- leg, and you have to kind of try to crawl around to the outside of his leg and then up. Sort of the same kind of problems you had with uh, Shadow of Colossus from time to time. Now, is this is this a problem of in the game you're still climbing the leg or you know you're still on the back it still looks like you're interacting with it or is it one of is it like a clipping issue where you're clipping through it's not a clipping issue okay. although there there are a few what you might argue as clipping issues um, it's more like this if you adjust your camera 
the directionality uh, that you need to go changes. So it's not intuitive. Like if if you push the the direction of your joystick to the left, he'll go far enough left so that it switches so that now you're going back right again. And so you have to use this sort of uh, combination of I'm going to adjust my camera to the right angle and then also use the joystick. And honestly, it's just easier if you just drop off, go around and jump back up like you meant to if you aimed wrong. See, it's those kinds of little things. But yet there's also some other, um, I would call them tweaks, problems, if you will. You're supposed to be able to look a, look away whenever you're hanging and then jump sort of, sort of a wall jump technique. We've had this for, gosh, for a decade, two decades almost, with the wall jump idea. Mm-hmm. Super uh, Metroid. Yeah, exactly. Um, or or I would point to like Prince, Mario of, Prince of Persia did all the wall techniques really yeah. well. Uh, anything in the Assassin's Creed series, you're going to understand free running. Uh, and so he's got these... Uh, what should be these great kid like abilities of agility and all of this. And I kept, there was a moment where I was hanging from his tail down underneath and I was supposed to jump over to, I knew exactly what I needed to do, but it wasn't intuitive. And I kept hitting the wrong button. And then when I loaded it back up, there was a cutscene, And so I had to watch the cutscene go through the thing, climb down the wall, climb down the tail, do it again. And then dad gum it. I hit the wrong button again. Oh, that's frustrating. And so it's little moments like that that are, that are, I don't want to say stealing the fun, but causing mild levels of frustration that are just enough that I'm like, um, okay, yeah, the, the complaints are valid. Uh, if you don't love the franchise, if you don't love that element of, oh my goodness, those are suits of armor and I can tell they're going to come to life and they're going to attack me. Is that going to happen now? Or is that going to happen in five minutes? Or is it going to happen when they get uh, magical blue power? When is this going to happen? And oh, my uh, pony dragon. Puppy dragon. Puppy dragon. <laughs> uh, my, my puppy dragon. Uh, you know, he suddenly he's like growling and his eyes change color and he's going to come after me. And and there's this narration element. Uh, I don't know enough Japanese to know whether or not it's like real Japanese or fake, fake Um Pekingese? I don't know. Is that a thing? But um, Actually, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. But that's a different kind of yeah. puppy dragon. Um, but there's this narration. And you've got this old man. Um, and I actually kind of like this. And he's like, um, at, at that point, I did not know that it would become my best friend. And it's... He, you're reading this in subtitle. It's all in sub, subtitles, sorry, eco style, eco style. But it, there's a, I don't know. It's almost like there's a disjointedness to it because it steals from the danger for the boy to have this all be told as a story, if that makes sense. Um, so these are all minor, minor complaints. It's everything I expected it to be. But I'm not going, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe I waited so long. Why, this is so amazing, and I absolutely love it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, uh, wouldn't you say that's one of those games where you can't possibly not be disappointed in it? Well. Because it had so much hype. Like, it had so much hype behind it, and people were expecting so much. And it was it was ex- exaggerated because – or uh, amplified, excuse me. Yes. Because it took so long to come out. It like, a, like a Star Wars so film, long. if you know too much about it, well, you're going to be about, disappointed well, in it. Hold on, though. This is, I'm this setting is, Jim up because well, I know how is, he feels about it. <laughs> Let's but, not go there. Well, right but now. also this this was very different, too, because, yeah. you know, there wasn't that big of a gap between 7 and 8 anyway. Fair but, enough. But the, the length of time that we were expecting. Six years. Yeah. This Last Guardian was in development for a long time. Too long, actually. It was. I agree. And so when you have a game that's in development for that long. And the hype is built up by previous games that this company had mm-hmm. done that were both critically acclaimed, yeah. both very highly regarded by both fans and, and very critics. Good. Um, yeah, well, yes. I mean, I, I would I would agree mostly. I, oh, let me let me put it this way: I felt they were very good, and I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them a lot too. But that's I, one of the reasons maybe why I didn't play Last Guardian was because I heard so many. And you're making me kind of want to play it anyway. You should. I heard a lot of negative things, and part of that may have been because people were expecting a masterpiece. Right. Because it was billed as, this is the next masterpiece. And then we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And by the time it came out, like you say, it felt more like a PS3 game, mm-hmm. kind of, on a PS4. And maybe that that took a little bit of the uh, the oomph out of it. So let me put it this way. With the disclaimer that I have not yet finished Last Guardian, if you handed me all three discs and you said, you can only play one of these three games ever again, which one do you choose? I choose Ico. Ico was my favorite of the first of the two yeah. that I played. Yeah, back in my Minecraft days, I always wanted to build the castle. 
So let me ask you this, Doc. Um, reckless speculation. Yeah. Uh, would you say that the puppy dragon dies at some point and it's really sad? Uh, probably. Okay. I don't know. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a magical puppy dragon, so it kind of has to. It yeah. saved, it. it you die, and then it saves your life, and then it dies in your place. Well, and... you know, arguably that's already happened, and it's kind of weird. I, mm. I don't fully understand. And this is part of it. I may be getting lost in some of the, let's call it Eastern mythology, that I don't understand. You know what I'm saying? You remember that Star Trek episode where he's like, Shaka with the walls fell? Yes. And, and Next Generation. Yeah, it, yes. it's, yes. it's called, uh, what is that? what's that episode um, called? Uh Dharma, it's called it's Dharma at Tanagra. Dar- yeah, Dharma and Jalada at Tanagra. Yes, at Tanagra. And, and and it's just Tanagra. called Dharma. That's yeah. the name. And and Picard is down on the planet, and he has to learn the, best the mythology in order to understand what this guy is saying. Because they all talk in like metaphor and like callbacks. Right. To that's all they. That's all they and, talk about is metaphor. Yeah. Okay, so that's the thing. I feel like a, a really brilliant metaphor is being presented to me here with the three games that I don't have the vocabulary to understand culturally. I could be totally wrong, and that could be the whole point. But that's one of the things that I love about it, and it succeeds there. And because of that, it hits the right notes, and I am enjoying it. And I'm going to go home this afternoon, and I'm going to take down the Christmas tree, and then I'm going to play it, and I'm going to let my three year old son watch me. And he's going to every time every time I sneak away, and the dragon is waiting for me, he's going to go where dragon is, where dragon is, because that's what he does. He wants to see the dragon. We could just sit there with him on the screen all day and, and watch him scratch himself, and he'd be totally happy. So, uh, <laughs> marketing opportunity. Guys, uh, just what? Let, oh, let, I'm sure there's stuffed animals. Let Trico, Last Guardian plushie. Yeah, and 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 that's that's one of the things. Like the name of the the puppy dragon is Trico, right? Or, or Trico, I think, is the way that the kid says mm. it. That's that's so completely on the nose. T R I C O. When the first game was named I C O. I don't know. There's just he's got horns. Uh, you, the whole thing in the second, it's like the first and the second one are brought together with horns. There's these thematic elements that are all there. I, he's, a, he's a giant creature. Yeah, like a you know, and and so I, the speculation, conspiracy theories have always been that those first two games existed in the same world, and and this third one just feels so much like it exists in that same world. I want to know more about this world, and I know that if I do, it will ruin it. And, oh yeah, and and that's. Because they're such standalone experiences. Yeah, I, that's my happy right. place. It's like whenever we watched the last season of Lost and we were like, oh, okay, yeah. They they actually were just in limbo the whole time. Got it. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, eh. Sometimes the mystery is only, Spoilers. only Small interesting monster. when it's still a mystery. Yeah. Although, to be fair to J.J. Abrams, if you watch his TED Talk about the mystery box, brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. He doesn't listen to his own stuff, but it's brilliant. Because <laughs> then he opens the box. Don't open the box. But that's it. Yeah. If you loved the first two, uh, pick it up. It's worth it. It's kind of uh, dropped in price, and I think it's it's totally worth it to play. It may take a few minutes to get used to the kind of wonky controls and figure out what you're doing, but once you do, I think you'll have fun with that story. Doc, you had me at dropped at price. Oh, okay. <laughs> is, it, is it at 20 or below now? I have no idea. That's kind of my price it was a Yeah, it was a, it was a Christmas present, so ah. it was free for me. Because I think greatest hits are 20, aren't they? If it if it know. hit that, I don't know if it I don't know if one. it did. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Worth, well, worth researching. Yeah, I'm, I actually do plan to check that out at some point this year. This is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Nintendo Switch, the new console that came out this year in March, I believe. It sounds about and, right. I haven't heard of it. Oh, you haven't? No. Okay. You haven't uh, made the Switch. It's not yet. <laughs> Doc is all about the really bad puns today <laughs> noticed. i'm just a just guy. Today. um so i've been reason, hanging out with will parsons that's part of it <laughs> yeah, that i can see um the reason why i wanted to bring this up is because the switch has been a colossal success and i wanted to talk about what that might mean maybe maybe just in the industry or for um nintendo or whatever y'all think so um i kind of wanted to kind of pick your brains on this right? it means the console is dead because everyone thinks mobile is console Right. Well, that's one of the things I want to talk about. So let's Excellent. let's talk about this. So there was a lot of calls with the Wii U, which we all we all recognize at this point was, at least from a financial standpoint, a failure, and from a um, marketing standpoint and helping the brand of Nintendo, a failure. Right. It had a few good games that I felt it had a few great games, but it didn't have that many games. Period. And not a lot of people bought it. The Wii U. The Wii U. Okay. That's what I'm talking about, right? Which is true. I mean, in terms of sales. Um, so the from cur- a marketing standpoint, you're absolutely yes. right. Well, and from a sales standpoint too. That's what I meant. So the, so, so the current. The current um, sales of the Switch have recently surpassed. The Switch has been out for about 10 months. Switch sales have surpassed the lifetime sales of the Wii U in Japan already. 
Also, the Switch has, um, in North America, it has become the um, fastest selling console in its first 10 months of life of any console ever. That includes the PS2. Wow. That includes the original Nintendo. Nice. So these are two historic, um, well, the first, well, the second one's historic. The, the first one is kind of like a nice factoid. Um, the point <laughs> being that the Switch has, be, has been not just a, a, it hasn't just sold well, is my point. It's a colossal success. Currently, if it continues at this sort of pace, it's going to easily be the best-selling console I'm glad to see it. within about a year and a half or so, right? And you can see too. There's, an, I've noticed a trend in the industry of like a lot more games now are like including Switch support. People are making a point of making sure their games are on well, the Switch. Well, yeah, it's with, because it's selling so right. Well. Exactly. With, with with these initial sales, they'd be stupid not to. Exactly. Right. So my question then becomes because right before, well, before I get to my question, let me put it this way: right before this happened, and of course we they they've had these these articles for a while about Nintendo should just give up making consoles altogether. They should just sell their games on the PS4 and the, the micro, and Xbox. And they should just sell games on the smartphone, and they don't need to make consoles anymore, right? Was there's a lot of this talk. It's been going on for a while. It happened with the GameCube, and then the Wii came out, and they shut up. <laughs> then it happened with the with the Wii U. And they're like, ooh, like, they like pop and, out of their little holes they in came the ground. Up again, <laughs> right. And then now the Switch came out and was so successful. So now we're going to wait for the Switch U and see what happens then. Sure. <laughs> well, you, would, you would expect them not to make the same mistake again, though. That was a this is the Wii U is one of their biggest failure since the virtual virtual boy. So, I mean, that's a huge, (laughs) it really was, I mean, in terms of financially. Yeah. So we're at a point now where, um, the state of Nintendo has done a complete 180 reversal, right? So, but they did so with a console that is also a handheld. That's what the switch is. Mm -hmm. It's both. Yeah. It's both a, it combines the concept of gaming on the go a dedicated gaming system on the go, like a 3DS or mm-hmm. a Game Boy or what have you, with a home console system. So it's both of them at the same time. And it's it's a colossal success, maybe maybe in part, I'm sure in part because of that. Mm-hmm. So so, the, so my question is, what, what happens to the industry? Because as we've seen historically, when Nintendo does something, because they typically are the innovators, it's usually not Microsoft or Sony, it's usually mm-hmm. Nintendo. That's true. They, Nintendo innovates in some way, whether it's within a game itself, like Breath of the Wild. What? We have to have a motion control now. Or like with we, oh, we have to all have motion control because we were successful. Yeah. You know, Nintendo, like all of these things. So so what does this mean for the industry, the success of the Switch? Or does it mean anything? Well, the obvious answer is that we can maybe expect to see future iterations of the PlayStation and Xbox be also mobile consoles. Agreed. So you think they're going to do the same PS6. thing where it's both? PS6. The one, pro- the one issue with that, though, is that Nintendo making both a handheld that's also a home console, they made a system that is not as strong as it could have been if it was a dedicated home console. Well, I, I look at it this way. I've been predicting this for a while, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, for over a decade, I've been saying that consoles are going to shrink down to the size of our phones. Okay. Now, at the time, I wasn't necessarily thinking that it would have a screen the way that our phone has a screen or the way that the Switch has a screen. But Basically, what it would mean is that I could slip it into my pocket, I could take it over to my friend's house, and then I could set it next to the TV, that wirelessly it would connect to the TV, and wirelessly the controllers, because this is important to me, I want full hand size controllers. Now, I love the way the Switch breaks apart, but I've got a, I've got a Switch Pro controller, and I use it for everything that will take it. I love it, um, because it's a traditional style controller. Right. Um, so to me, the PS6, again, I don't want to talk about 5 here, because it's already on the drawing board. Um, but the PS6, I think, will be about the size of, um, let's call it a, an iPhone Plus, right? And then um, you're going to have everything that just sort of connects to it wirelessly. That's my prediction. Um, and, it, and I think it's going to have the full processing power of uh, what we would expect of a full HD, full uh, well, rendering it, it sure generation will, computer. It sure will. Well, let's not go that far. It, it will it will have the processing power. It'll have more processing power because if we're if you're talking about the six, how many years in the future is that? Ten. Sure, it'll have significantly more power than than what we're seeing now. However, is it ten or is it more like fifteen years? Do you think? 10, well, 10 you know, to 15, we've, 12. We've, we've had this debate before, but the the PS Five is supposed to be coming out in t- this year in twenty eighteen. Oh, really? I don't think it's coming out. You don't this think year. so? Okay. Well, then let's we'll say talk, it hits. We'll talk yeah, some I, think speculation. The, I think this generation. Let's still say got it hits twenty nineteen. But here's the thing: because they just released the PS. What was it called? PS4 X or whatever. PS4 Pro or something. So, yeah. so, so who has who, who has a PlayStation uh, portable, a PSP? I had the 
the original PSP, but not the Vita. Okay. I so, have a Vita, but never use it. Okay. See, there and you I go. I didn't use the PSP So much. I think what's going to happen is, is that we're going to see that blending of the Vita technology and the PlayStation technology, but the, the marketing is going to be, listen, it's as convenient as the Vita, but it does everything. Everything your PlayStation does. So, and, and the weird thing it, is, the Vita already kind of does. The, some I was going to say, yeah, like, but it's not. They never marketed it well, and it also doesn't do it well enough. Uh, but you have to have both in order to do what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Whereas yeah. the Switch does, and that's the big change with yeah. the Switch. And so I think that's and what's going to happen my, is my, the next generation yes. Vita, if you will, is going to and I could just see be that. blended with the PS6. I, I could see that. They the, might not even my, call it a PS6. My issue is that whenever you do that, though, you're going to take a hit in the processing power. Now, may, now. Because we're talking about the future, sure, it'll be more powerful than what we have now. But for you to say that it's going to be at the same level of, you know, even like a medium level PC, oh, I, I can't believe. I didn't. I it's going to have that generation's that. processing. Power. It's going to have a yeah. level that's below. I was the talking PC. console. Okay. Okay. So think of it as three that's tiers. I kind of wanted you've to got make that PC point. processing power. You've got console processing power, and you've got mobile processing power. And what I was saying is that you're going to have a mobile device that finally is able to have the equivalent of a console's processing power for that generation. And the reason why that's going to be true is because as we make the shift to mobile, quote unquote, by blending this uh, crazy Frankenstein thing that's going to be all the consoles are now mobile, what we're going to do is we're going to just skip a generation of processing power. Yeah. And I, as I everything gets that, yeah. smaller, it, it, it's, like it's going to be the same power and, as the previous generation I, I, I console. Think, you see what I'm saying? But yeah, do, it's, I, it's, it's like the idea of like, Kind of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, except we're talking about processing well, power. It's, it's, <laughs> that's it's a terrible metaphor. There's, there's no Nick, longer going to be any sort of middle class, yeah. which is the console. Well, yeah. It's just going to be mobile and well, okay, you so know, I, dedicated I, I PC. I want to be careful about using the term mobile because when people hear mobile, they think – because mobile gaming right now means – on your smartphone. On your phone, and I want or to be your clear, iPad, or your portable. Yeah, but yeah. I want portable. to be clear that, that this is a either portable, used to either I would use the term either portable or handheld because mm. we've used that to describe these because these That's are fair. these That's are fair. dedicated gaming systems. Even though sometimes you can do other things Correct. on it, they are dedicated gaming systems where your smartphone, you play you can play games on it, but it is not a dedicated gaming Well, that's, gaming a, that's system. a really important point because like the PS3 is basically a dedicated uh, Pentium 90 equivalent. That's a terrible, terrible PC processor. But as a dedicated system that does nothing else but play the console game, it works just fine because it's not distracted by, I'm not going to say an OS because it has one. It just doesn't have, you know, Windows. Right. You know what it, I'm it saying? It doesn't have your web browser in the background. Right. And, and I can't pull up my, my Excel spreadsheets to my great disappointment. Yeah, <laughs> your TPS reports are going to be delayed. But uh, that's that's my reckless speculation in that. I think I think you're not too far off, honestly. I yeah. mean, I was thinking along the same line. I've been I, saying I, it for years, though. I, I think that because what they have right now, and Jamie, you alluded to this earlier, is the cross-save functionality of um, PS Vita and PS4. Right. Um, right. Where the same game will come out on both, and you have to buy both, yeah. which is yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, problematic. Yeah, yeah. I could see them going to a model where you buy one, and you can basically download it onto both of your um, devices, yeah. if you will, and possibly like they configure it such that on the console it's going to have a higher graphical output than it's going to have on the portable one. They just like have settings to get tweaked automatically. But, but don't they have like it that. like right now? Because again, I don't have a Vita. This is just me. I do have a PS4. Mm -hmm. This is me hearing about what it can do, mm -hmm. and it you cannot play like I can't just go. I want to play my Vita game on my TV screen. Is that correct? I think you can if you have the right adapters. Um, but without a PS4. Without a PS4. It's like it's a little bit – because what you can do is you can stream your PS4 to your Vita. You can actually play your PS4 games yes, on I'm, the Vita Yes, I'm aware screen. of that. Um, I don't think – to my knowledge, I don't think you can play your PS Vita games on your PS4, but you can plug your Vita into the TV, if and that does, makes sense. And, and while this is all so complicated, the Switch is sitting over here with just a thing that you stick into yeah, a exactly. slot. Right. Yeah. And so it streamlines – it makes <laughs> it simpler. Yeah. Yeah. It's a streamlined version of like a concept that maybe could have worked mm -hmm. had they found a way to – utilize it correctly exactly which, yeah yeah okay. so two things sense. two things as we wrap this up uh the first is uh we've got a docking port right now uh and i actually think that the weakness of the switch is the docking port i think if they'd found a way to do it without that docking port it would have been so much stronger like if you want to charge your uh your switch while you're playing it you've got that cord underneath it and i get why they did it because gravity but at the same time then you can't prop it up anymore and charge it anymore there's this just so brilliant, easily easy solution to that, and it's that you you make it an L shaped charger and you plug it in underneath. Well, but here's you know what I'm here's saying. Something that Nintendo loves doing with their handhelds, though. What's that? I've done this for years. They'll come out with a handheld. It'll have 
one flaw mm -hmm. that people constantly talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, how could Nintendo forget and then they to fix add it? like an audio jack or something? You know, literally, they'll, yeah. they'll do that. And then they have a revision that fixes yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good point. They okay. do this all the time. So, so all, all I'm saying yeah, is... I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> my, my description was this. You set it next to your TV. Your t it connects to your TV. Uh, sort of Chrome style. There's probably some, some little widget you stick in your TV. That's not my point. Um, but it's all wireless and everything is wireless. And, and because I've walked into Jim's house, which I do all the time. <laughs> Even when I'm not there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> especially, especially, yeah. especially when you're not <laughs> when there. When you're at work, that's where I'm at. I'm at Jim's. No. Uh, no, I, I just walk into your house and I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm going to plug my little uh, you know dongle into your TV. And I set my, uh, let's call it the Switch 2, down in front of your TV Boom, it connects, and we're playing. You know what I'm saying? I could see it even going a step further. We don't even have to plug it in. Um, I could see it being we get to a point where our streaming gets so good, yeah. um, our bandwidth gets so good that we can actually have like a Chromecast sort of thing. That's going to require where, new TV technology, but I agree with you. Well, and even if it's not necessarily a TV, you just have something plugged in, but you don't even have to plug the Wii U or you don't have to plug the Switch into a dock. Mm -hmm. That's All what you have to saying. do is just That is exactly say, what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, he's saying yeah. you have the Chromecast that you plug in and then you have your Switch that so you're to, using it. To the use the visual room. metaphor. And then if you want to charge, you can have like maybe just like a wireless yeah. charging pad. So to use the, the visual metaphor, I walk in uh, to Jim's just because I'm just going to hang out. And you're like, hey, you want to play that new game? I just got it. Cool. And I pull my phone out because it's saved on my phone, right? I subscribe to the Nintendo service. It doesn't matter that I have an iPhone 75, right? <laughs> I just play, I plug that down because what we're talking about is a service at this point, not even hardware. It's all data. It doesn't matter what the hardware is. It's all data. That's my reckless speculation for 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, is that the idea that we are using uh, I think you're hardware. I think you're dreaming small if you're thinking 50, but. Oh, I, whatever. Yeah. But I think I'm you're thinking you're, 20. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're all going to be. Uh, uh, it all depends on the economics of it. But my point is simply this. Uh, I think the that the, the hardware is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The data is going to get faster and faster and faster. It's going to look better and better and better. And it's going to get to the point where it doesn't matter where we are or who we're with, as long as we have our thumbprint digitally or otherwise we're going to be able to access our data and we're going to be able to play our games done it's time for game show where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show what sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on game show let's find out right now on game show so I've prepared a little game for us today, and this is something that I uh, alluded to last episode when we had a bunch of our games, but I didn't get this one done quite in time. Uh, so now what we've got is our 2017 year in haiku. Um, you might recall back in, I think it was episode four. Uh, what is with you in haikus? I it like haiku. Um, but back in episode four, I did a bunch of video game mm -hmm. haiku just for fun. Um, and I decided to revive that again. But this time we're talking about only games that we talked about this past year. Okay. Um, are, so are you going to make us come up with haiku on the fly? Cause I don't no, think not, I can do that. Not this time. Okay. Not this time. Um, <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. So, uh, what we're going to be doing is, uh, we're going to go around, this, uh, go around the table. I'm going to start with uh, Nick and we'll just work around a clock. Clockwise. Um, and what's going to happen is you got uh, an opportunity after I read this to guess what game I'm talking about. Uh, if you get it right, you get five points. If you don't get it right, we move on to Jim, for example. And actually, Jim, you get a chance to hit seven points. Okay. Um, and then we would Wait, move... I get more points. Exactly. And then we move on to Doc if you get that wrong, and he has a chance at five points. So five, it goes back down? Five, seven, five. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> I'm totes fine with that. Mm -hmm. What is with you in haiku? I don't really know. Mm. Very well done. <laughs> Clever. It's a gift. So we might as well go and get started. I wouldn't try to publish that, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, will, I will warn you in advance. I think that my uh, my haiku skills have improved a little bit since the last time, but I'm still definitely not an expert. So um, bear, bear, bear with the, the poor haiku. Welcome and, to Chris, haiku expert. <laughs> yeah, right. For very traditionalists out there, this will, uh, this will probably annoy you somewhat. So a starless black sky... Over peaks and valleys gray, the wedding bells toll. What is the game? Super Mario Odyssey. That is correct. Yeah, it's because the Five moon. Yeah. yeah, that would have been my guess as well. I oh, haven't well. played it yet. I haven't played it. I just went by the trailer. Jim. <laughs> okay. Leaves crunch underfoot and gazing from the tree line, an aggressive owl. <laughs> I know this I one. Know this. 
Aggressive owl. Say that. Say that one more time. Wait, wait. Uh, what's the what's the rule here? You said there was a rule. Um, like it's all games that we talk that we played this, this year. year. This year, or we talked about on the podcast this year. Okay. Say it one more time. Leaves crunch underfoot, and gazing from the tree line, an aggressive owl. I'm just gonna say Horizon Zero Dawn. Incorrect, Doc. That would be Stranger Things. That is correct. What? Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Stranger Things, the game. Oh, okay. I never played the game. Okay. I told you to. I told you it was I brilliant. <laughs> I, I told you we knew to. people who did it. I told I'm you that st- former students helped make this game. But no, do you listen to me? I have the game. On, I have the game on my phone. I just have. Okay, played you're, it. you're off the hook then. <laughs> so had, I just. It's just on my. That's another issue that I have. Where I'll get games on my phone and I'll like I'm going to play this because it seems pretty interesting. I just won't play it. Compulsive. I'm not into. Fire. I'm not into mobile phone games. I, Eh, just can't that's fine. Even when they're good, I'll start playing them, and I just get a three There's and a so half year old. You'll, you'll yeah, change that your I've mind. That I bought on my Steam library that I haven't played either. So oh, that's another issue. Yeah. While he's watching Umi Zumi, you can actually play a game. It's great. <laughs> All right. So Doc has uh, seven points from that question, and now Doc, it is your question. Kicks. Did, did I genuinely steal that and get points? Yes. You got, you got seven, seven rock points. On. I can like em- embarrass myself now with, and still be winning. Yes. Kicks and punches fly. Violence and bright colors under the spotlight. Oh, oh, uh, okay. So that switch game with the, the arms, metal arms, long arms, but something arms. You're looking for arms. Arms? Arms. So I was right. Incorrect. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you got to admit. It's called arms. Good answer. But yeah. Okay. I will give you that. Yeah. Nick. Read it again. Kicks and punches fly. Violence and bright colors under the spotlight. Oh, is it one of the Street Fighter games? Incorrect. Okay. That was a good guess. I was thinking that myself. Also, if, even if it had been one of the Street Fighter games, you'd have to make him say with the game, right? You couldn't just you can't just say one of the Street Fighter games, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, well, he was just so wrong. Okay. I just, <laughs> okay. I just, I, I you're, you're not tell. even you're not even wrong. <laughs> you could have played it up. You could yeah. have been you could have made him pick one and then trick me into thinking it might have been another one. Anyway. <laughs> I'm I'm merciful. Jim, do you want me to read it again? Yes, please. Kicks and punches fly. Violence and bright colors under the spotlight. I'm going to say Pokemon Tournament. Incorrect. Is it Super Smash Bros. 4? Nope. Please okay. don't be... Is it, it better not be Splatoon. That's my other option. We were looking for Chroma Squad. Oh, I oh. played that game. Mm-hmm. See? I'm like, ah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. It's what hard is to... Okay. It was basically... It's a tactical RPG kind of. It's a Sentai. Did you listen to the 112... That, uh, I, I understood was, half the words you just okay. said. <laughs> <laughs> I talked and they about were, it. did you listen yeah. to 112? <laughs> I talked about it on the episode where uh, Nick and I met up and just said enough. Basically, it's a game. It's like a tactical game, but it's, you're in a studio and you're filming a Power Rangers-like show. Oh, okay. It's, it's, like yeah. a, it's like a, think Fire Emblems or Final Fantasy Tactics, but instead you're making a, you're filming a uh, Super Sentai or Power Rangers show and you create your, um, your characters and the storyline and stuff like that. And then you follow through the plot of the episode. I mean, you try to get more fans and stuff like that. Okay. Nick, we with a smile bid welcome to our warm inn, the chill of undeath. Was that English? Do that again. We with a smile bid welcome to our warm inn, the chill of undeath. Hmm. I have no idea. Um, Something with zombies. Just take a wild guess, and then let's move on. Un- undead zombies. Well, I don't even remember all the games we talked about this year. Well, I didn't even remember games that I've apparently... I'm the only one that's played at this table. I still don't remember the games. Played. All right, I'm going to go out on an extreme <laughs> limb and say Breath of the Wild. Incorrect. Okay. Jim. Yes. We, with a smile, bid welcome to our warm inn, the chill of undeath. Hmm. Even though it's not an inn, it does seem similar enough i'm gonna say resident evil 7 that in- would have been my guess incorrect okay doc oh boy we with a smile bid welcome to our warm in the chill of undeath uh skyrim incorrect oh well we were looking for hearthstone knights of the frozen throne oh i would have never gotten that oh, i never even played I, it i get it i mm-hmm. get it i yeah uh. in <laughs> see um, i i chose breath of the wild because technically you were resurrected and uh, you go to inns <laughs> yeah there you go and uh, they seem nice okay not, not terrible logic yeah don't okay. hate the poet that's all i gotta say <laughs> no you can't don't hate you. the players hate the game <laughs> and oh boy do i hate this game <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm with you okay that. so now it is jim correct this is like the yes. first one i've ever been winning so i'm okay with it <laughs> all right 
Before the white stone, from out of a blue light's flash, heroes from beyond. Breath of the Wild. It's got to be. It's got to be. All that is true for Breath of the Wild, though. Perhaps. So. I think some of these should have only one answer. I think that's the big problem. <laughs> that they have, like, arguable answers that are not the one that you picked. Well, I had but definitely one in mind, and I didn't think I believe, of that. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, Doc. Yeah, you, you're reading me the same one? or mm-hmm. Okay. Have Bef- fun with this one, Doc. <laughs> Before the white stone, from out of a blue light's flash, heroes from beyond. He rose from beyond. Uh, it's probably one of your uh, f- flame heroes games. What are those things called? I'll, I'll give you that. It's Fire Emblem. Fire. Oh, come on. You yeah, cannot you give him that. Flame no, heroes no, games. No, 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 no. He is not getting points <laughs> That's for that. totally what I was he thinking He is not give you, getting points for like saying, oh, it's probably flame one of those games, games. Flame <laughs> hero games. You're, no, you're I, not giving him points I, for that. I qualified that, that with, with Nick, your. Were you going to get that? I wasn't going to get it. It doesn't okay, matter. I'm giving it to no, Doc. No, it doesn't give matter. To he doesn't get points. You knew what I was talking about. He doesn't get points. That is not fair. You have to say the name of the game. He did No, no. He didn't even say Fire Emblem. He said Flame Heroes. <laughs> close. He did say heroes. He didn't even get one word of the game. Heroes is in the title. No, come on. It's a fire. Em- no, I'm sorry. You cannot give him that. Fire and heroes are two of the three words. Look, he said flame. If we're playing a game, <laughs> if we're playing a game and the rules are you have to say the name of the game. He didn't even say the series that the game was in. He made up a completely different name. You cannot give <laughs> yeah, him that. Yeah, because when he points. said flame heroes, I was thinking like I don't know some uh, some other fire. He knew game. what I was talking about <laughs> because, because he loaned he's me the game. Looking for the right answer. That doesn't mean he, <laughs> he knows the right answer. The, he loaned me the game and he knew I hated it. So my derisiveness <laughs> was actually cannot, a part of my answer. Matter. Well, okay, Doc is doesn't winning matter. anyway, so he it doesn't matter. He does not get those points. Come on, dude. I don't, don't be need ridiculous. those points, Jim. So I'm gonna. That's but fine. But I'm gonna take them. No, you're not taking them. You're not. We're stricken in those from the record. I'm gonna put those down as if there's a tiebreaker. That will be the tiebreaker. That works for me. All right, so we started with Jim that one, right? No, we started with Doc on that one. No, we didn't. Oh, no. What? We started yeah. with the gym. Oh, yeah, no. So. You, 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 managed, okay. you had your chance. You missed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, Doc. Wait, wait. You've given him all... Okay, whatever. <laughs> he did not get that one. I'm just pointing okay. it out. Okay. <laughs> I, I put it down as the tiebreaker, if needed. Yeah. I'm putting it down as he didn't get it. Okay. Doc, in the mirror are one bloodshot eye, fear, and the black between the stars. Whoa. I have no idea, but I really like that haiku. Thank you. Uh, black between the stars. Bloodshot eye. Hmm. I, I guess I'll go with, like, Resident Evil 7 since... No? Yes? Incorrect. Okay. Nick, for seven points. In the mirror are one bloodshot eye, fear... And the black between the stars. One bloodshot eye. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Incorrect. Jim for five points. That would have been my second guess. In the mirror are one bloodshot eye, fear, and the black between the stars. Uh, that one game that you're thinking of? <laughs> no. no, I'm kidding. Uh, Prey. Correct. Yeah. Nick, a streak of fire crashes against waves of green. A cry for mother. Oh, mommy. Oh, um, Horizon Zero Dawn? Incorrect. Oh, man. Oh, that was a These good These are all so guess. vague. That was a good guess. That was a that super was a really good, good guess. guess. Especially the yeah. cry from other stuff. That was yeah. a good one. Jim, yeah. for yeah. seven points. A streak of fire crashes against waves of green. A cry for mother. God, I actually... I don't know. Okay. Doc, for five points. A streak of fire crashes against waves of green. A cry for mother. Final Fantasy 15. Incorrect. Okay. I was looking for Orcs Must Die. Oh, I would have never gotten that. I'd never played that. Mommy! Okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Beige and green and green. Cricket chirps as words appear. Greetings, Professor. Greetings, Professor. Okay, um... Near Autonoma? 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 I gotta say it right, or Jim's gonna, like... <laughs> no, that's close. That, I would count that as close enough. <laughs> Automata. 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 We should let Jim be the Automata P. I don't think that's the right answer. But that is the, okay. Yeah, that is the name of the game. Okay. Nick, for seven points. Because you still said near. Yeah. You got near one of the main You got pretty near. You know, it's just like <laughs> yeah. flame and fire. <laughs> Nick. And heroes. Beige and green and green. Cricket chirps as words appear. Greetings, Professor. Uh, I'm going to go out on another extreme limb. And say Breath of the Wild. Incorrect. (laughs) 
Yeah. Because there's a professor in that game, and there's crickets in it, too. Yes. <laughs> that is true, I suppose. <laughs> Jim. Beige and green and green. Cricket chirps as words appear. Greetings, professor. Greetings, professor. That's the part that's really throwing me. I know it has to be the most important part, though. Um... That one game about time travel where you, like, stuck a hot dog in a microwave. <laughs> I like it, but no. no. I'm kidding. No. Don't count that. <laughs> I would have given that to you, by the way. <laughs> that, <laughs> is, that is specific <laughs> enough. <laughs> what I was looking for was Comrade. Oh, right. What is, uh, what is that? See, know. I've never played, like, any That's of these the games. That's the text-based game. Oh, it was so good. Comrade was so good. Oh, that game yes. that you talked about. All right. And, okay. and, and now as soon I as you said, Greetings about. Professor, I'm like, I, I know familiar? I've <laughs> played that game. I know I have. What is it? Mm-hmm. Man, I feel dumb now. That's a great game. Everyone needs to go download Comrade, play it on their phone. It's like three hours. Do it. Right. Do it. Do it. Nick. Mm. Blood runs down my face, but I can't hold back my grin. My true self laid bare. Um, uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance? Incorrect. I like it up. <laughs> Jim. Persona, I didn't know if we Persona talked about five. it. Persona 5. You got it. Yeah. Seven points. Oh, of course I didn't get that one. I knew that one right when you said it, with the blood and the grin. <laughs> yep. Okay. These are actually really good, though. I'll say that you did, you did, a, lot, you did a really good job. Your haiku, haiku is getting better. Thank you. Yeah, they're, they're really Marginally. good. Marginally. <laughs> <laughs> you can Thanks, publish. <laughs> All right. And last question for Jim. Or starting with Jim. Around a campfire, sleepless and eternal night, sharing one last meal. I mean, it's got to be Breath of the Wild. Incorrect. That <laughs> all applies to Breath of the Wild, to be fair. But that's all I could think of. It's... Doc, for seven points. Okay. Around a campfire, sleepless in eternal night, sharing one last meal. Oh, boy. Uh, okay, so I probably can't get this because I'm not going to think of the title. But that... Oh, come on. Uh, oxen Free. Incorrect. Oxen Free. Oxen Free. That is a, that is a title. Yes, <laughs> that is a title. I was, I was going to go with that one where the teenagers were out in front of the cave and... Not and Oxen Free. Nick, for five points. Around a campfire, sleepless and eternal night, sharing one last meal. Um, it's down between two. Um, Shovel Knight? Incorrect. Is okay. it Final Fantasy XV? It is. Okay. Don't, ah. give, don't give me the points. But I Final thought of it right after I made my guess. I was like, oh, I should have said Final Fantasy XV because I'm pretty sure that's it. And the more you said it, I was like, yep. that's... Yeah. Yep. And right after I made my guess, I was like... So the winner is Jim with 12 points, Doc with seven, and Nick with five. You mean 14. <laughs> Depends on your opinion. But uh, <laughs> given that I was calling that the tiebreaker, Jim won uh, with the flat points, and so that would be 12 to 7. The Backward Compatible Crew presents their personal games of the year. So the first thing we're going to talk about in our uh, sort of year in review meaty topic here is the uh, each of our personal games of the year. And so I think we'll go ahead and start. We'll just take that same order, go to Nick, Jim, Doc, and then myself. Worth mentioning, too, on our podcast when we do Game of the Year, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be games that came out this year. It can always be something that we, for example, played for the first time this year. Nick's Honorable Mentions. But first, the way I define Game of the Year... The games that I played this year, not necessarily having come out in 2017, um, that simply I enjoyed the most, or that I thought were um, the best, even if they're not ne- well, technically well, the Well, hold on. Hold on, though. Which one is it? Because they're two separate things. Yeah, I think in this case, it's the, the one I objectively think is the best. Okay. But and they the, also mm-hmm. that happens to align with the sure, ones I enjoyed yeah, the right. most. I just, I just kind of wanted to yeah. see. Okay. All right, so my honorable mentions are Planet Coaster, which is a um, roller coaster tycoon type game actually made by the original developers of Roller Coaster Tycoon. This came out in November 2016, I believe. I remember when you talked about that, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. You, you, I, actually, I, you actually came on and talked about that last year. Yeah, it was, it's quite good. Um, and then my second honorable mention is Heat Signature, made by Tom Francis, a uh, developer of Gunpoint. Um, Which I desperately tried to get the code for and never could get to work. Yeah, I might just gift it to you on Steam at some point. Cause, that would be amazing. Yeah, But yeah, it's it, it's a very good game, and it was fun for the 10, 15 hours that I played it, but it, there's, it's not in my top three just because I couldn't keep playing it after a while. It, was just kinda, it got kind of samey. That's an interesting criteria. 
Mix nominees are... Hyper Light Drifter also came out in 2016. Um, I talked about this in episode 112 with Jim. Uh, Breath of the Wild, obviously, and Super Mario Odyssey. Good lineup. Those are my top three. Jim's Honorable Mentions. Initially, I was planning to just do the game I enjoyed the most, but we got into a discussion before the show started that I thought was interesting where if we could, because mainly kind of came from a discussion I had with Doc, where he had a kind of a different idea about what game of the year was. And I think it's more interesting if I name the game that I feel had the most effect on me personally. Um, I so, like that. so I'll say it's the one that impacted me the most. Mm-hmm. And my honorable mentions are um, Metroid Samus Returns. Yakuza Zero and Cuphead. Jim's nominees are Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild, Persona Five, and Near Automata. And because I am cheating, because I couldn't name just three, mm-hmm. I'm also going to include Yakuza Kiwami. Mm. So there's an important reason for that later. Uh, let me kind of explain my reasoning here. All three of these games, to me evoked some sort of like some sort of memory or feeling that I was able to carry on even after I finished playing the game. So uh, for example, Yakuza Kiwami had a even though I had never been to um, Japan in the 1980s, I still was able to connect with that location and place and I felt this this strange like false sense of nostalgia even though I, you know because it's not real nostalgia I'd never been there. Um, but I was able to connect with both that and um, uh, Kiru uh, K- Kazuma's story. I was able to connect with that. Um, also, the um, you know his sort of redemption tale and the connection that he had with his sort of like surrogate daughter. Um, with Breath of the Wild, for me, it was a return to again kind of like the old style um, exploration and um, ad- sense of adventure and mystery of the original Legend of Zelda. So for me, that um, kind of brought me back to that older place, older style of play. Um, so you're probably sensing a theme here. Persona 5, same kind of thing. Um, it brought me back, even though it was taking place in modern-day Japan, the sense of friendship that you have with your compatriots and um, the fact that you're striving for justice in sort of this very, I, I don't want to say childish, maybe maybe immature is a better term, or maybe an idealistic, perhaps. We'll go with that. I think idealistic is Idealistic, a right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also kind of a naive view of, of justice. And yet it's one that um, I kind of wish was true and mm-hmm. wish was possible. So it's one of those kind of almost, I would say less of a wish fulfillment, more of a um, remembrance of this is, this is the way I kind of used to think the world could be mm-hmm. sort of thing. It kind of brought me back to that mindset. For a little while, I was able to live in that space. Um, and then Nier Automata was... Um, for me, this this game that kind of and it wasn't just a sense of the music, but also the way that the story was told. Um, a lot of the uh, philosophical uh, questions, a lot of the ex- existentialism, um, you know, what it means to to be alive, what it means to exist, were things that I'd been thinking about at the time, and so it kind of hit me at the right moment. But also for the creativity and and particularly of the ending. So I don't want to go too much into any of those until we get to the number one. But those are my uh, top four. Doc's Honorable Mentions. Since I'm sort of responsible for this whole criteria breakdown thing, um, what I guess got me thinking about this at all was the idea of a a game of the year as a term, as an industry term. It has a tendency to mean uh, the game of a year edition of a triple a major game where they put all the dlc in and re-release it (laughs) right Um, and i've got i've got some interesting war stories about buying game of the year versions of this and that and it just coming with a little like sheet of paper to unlock the digital this and it's not actually on the disc and stuff like that but so to me game of the year is is about that it's it's about a commercially successful game and I, i played a lot of commercially successful games this year but that doesn't mean that they were my personal top game um, and, and what does that even mean? Well, does it mean that I, it's the game I had the most fun with? Was it my favorite game? Was it my most anticipated game? Because those are different things, too. So I have a lot of fun anticipating games. And then even if the game isn't that fun, I still 
enjoy the game. Mm-hmm. So uh, not a candidate for this year, but I could easily look back and and say that No Man's Sky was one of my top games of 2016 because it was so anticipated and I had fun uh, discovering how horrible it was. <laughs> but I but I I played hundreds of hours of that game. So uh, arguably, I, I got my money's worth still, even though the final verdict is that's a terrible game and I don't ever want to play it again. So all of that is to say simply this. I played a lot of little games this year, especially with the Switch and wanting to throw a few dollars here and there and, and kind of experience different things. And so candidates for potential top game might be Lego Worlds or Human Resource Machine or World of Goo or Death Squared or Last Guardian or... Goodness, there's just so many of them. But at least for Lego Worlds and Last Guardian, I'm not going to include those because I don't know them well enough yet. I haven't played them long enough yet. And I had a little problem with Lego Worlds I'm going to talk about in a future episode, but I won't go into it now. Doc's nominees are... Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Rime. That's R-I-M-E, by the way. Rime. Yeah, that. (laughs) There's on the comment. Chris's Honorable Mentions. So my criteria for Game of the Year are, um, it really comes down to which one I sort of appreciated the most, the one that I enjoyed the most uh, playing. Um, I tend also to, like, even though I'll find myself really enjoying a certain game, I also bring sort of a sense of objective good into it. And so it's not just which one's the objectively best one the one that if i was to sort of like look at everything critically i would say that this is the best game of the year but the one that i in my time playing had the most fun with uh and so by those criteria i would say my honorable mentions are um super mario odyssey i didn't get a chance to play that very much but when i did it was very very good a very well designed experience uh the legend of zelda breath of the wild which unfortunately i still haven't had a chance to finish but is another really excellent game i think all around And then also kind of a last minute uh, one that snuck in, I actually got um, Metroid Samus Returns for Christmas. And so um, I've been playing that a little bit. I still need to finish it before I can speak more to it. But what I've played so far has been a really excellent game. Um, I'm really impressed by some of the design decisions they did and the way that they've um, stayed true to the Metroid franchise while also taking some innovative steps forward with it. So I've really been enjoying that. Chris's nominees are... Nier Automata, Persona 5, and Sonic Mania. Um, and those are the same ones that I mentioned in our uh, Thanksgiving special when we were sort of doing our uh, anticipated mm-hmm. top games of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, Sonic Mania, I thought, was the really great, um, in that same way that I mentioned with Metroid, it like sort of pays homage to what came before while also making some really innovative uh, steps forward, I think, in certain ways. Um, they also have really excellent level design that do a great job of teaching the player as they play. So I think it's uh, one of the most well-rounded um, well-designed Sonic games I've seen, actually. Persona 5, obviously we've talked about at length. We had a whole um, uh, episode that Jim and I did where we had a two-person kind of roundtable called it Table for Two, uh, where we talked about that game in depth. So go listen to that if you want to hear more of our thoughts on that one. Um, and then Nier Automata, still haven't finished, but uh, what I have played so far has been uh, very interesting, kind of uh, philosophically, psychologically. I'm not sure the word I'm looking for there, but it seems to have some really interesting themes, and it's got a really cool presentation. So I've really been enjoying that one. Out of curiosity, how what uh, playthrough are you on in terms of? I'm still on the first first ending. I haven't finished the first run through yet. Okay, so you're still you haven't seen ending A yet. Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I still have a lot more to play on that one. I will as a tip. Feel free to experiment in doing things that you that might you might know have a, chan- a good chance of killing you mm-hmm. because you can trigger different endings just out of the blue. It'll mm-hmm. be like, okay, you're dead, mm-hmm. and then credits roll, and you get like triggered ending G mm-hmm. or something. It's really yeah, funny, I, I, and then I, they'll, but then they'll take you right back to where you were. I, I'm aware hmm. of the one where it's you can pretty un- clever. You can uninstall your OS chip or whatever. The uh, like basically, if you uninstall this, the entire system shuts yeah. down. There's, and there's a you. there's a lot of of, mm-hmm. of endings like that. There's mm-hmm. a lot of fun things you do, mm-hmm. and they make it to where it's really not punishing when you do it either. Mm-hmm. They do it as a That's joke. That's good. Yeah. yeah, like it takes you right back. It just loads right mm-hmm. where you left off. So let's go ahead and announce then our number one personal game of the year. Mix game of the year, Super Mario Odyssey. Just as a reminder, my category was what I consider to be the best game objectively which in this case also happens to line up with what is my favorite game earlier this year in the thanksgiving episode i uh mentioned that breath of the wild was probably going to be my favorite um but actually uh 
since then I have um, played a little bit more Breath of the Wild, and I was reminded of all the things that I don't like about it. Um, and also this year I've played a lot of other open world games, particularly um, Elder Scrolls Two, Daggerfall, Elder Scrolls Three, Morrowind. I've played those before, um, which is why they're not in my top list. But they're uh, they're you know very influential uh, open world games. And it's it's reminding me that all in all, Breath of the Wild, from a mechanical standpoint, is actually as an open world game not that great. It's it's solid as a Zelda game, but uh, there there are many things about it that are very frustrating. For instance, the weapon degradation system, where there's no way to repair your weapon or um, anything like that. So it just is like this, this wonderful feedback loop of, you know, getting a weapon as a cool reward for a dungeon. And then like five enemies later, it breaks. Um, Might be a slight exaggeration there. Uh, uh, depends d- on the weapon. It depends, depends on, on the, the weapon. Enemies. It, it depends on the difficulty <laughs> yeah. too. But no, I don't think that's too far a stretch. If you're fighting some tougher enemies, like yeah. five enemies will break a weapon. Did yeah. you ever, I'll ask you this though. Did you ever have trouble like keeping a weapon? Did you ever get to a point where you're like, oh, my, all my weapons broke. I literally have no weapons. Uh, that happened a couple were, times. And yet you were picking up weapons regularly. That, that happened a couple times, yeah. but okay. like, Because the... I never did. I was literally dropping weapons from my inventory constantly because I had too Me many. too, Joe. Oh. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, in the hard mode, um, that's not really a thing. Like, It gets to the point where you have to... All your good weapons will break, and then well, you have to get to... like. But all were you the... just swinging at things, or were you like... Because I was always careful about what weapon I used right. in what scenario. Yeah, yeah, I was careful. Really, I never. But had there, that there, there are enemies that are basically bullet sponges or sword sponges, I guess, in the in the hard mode. Um, but like, it, it, in, to contrast that with you know Daggerfall, for example, which is another game I played this year, um, you can go through a dungeon, which is a very very long experience, uh, and break your or not break your sword but it gets to the point where if you go into another dungeon you'll probably break it halfway through so you figure okay i'll go ahead and take a a, a day off in the game and get it repaired at the blacksmith in the closest town um so it the weapon degradation system in that game actually creates a really cool sense of pacing where it's not just like i'm gonna leave this dungeon and go straight to the next dungeon like skyrim style you you actually feel like you're part of this world and you're interacting with the people in the world so and and one's an RPG and one's not. That's true. To be fair, but yeah. So I I don't think the uh, I think the web, weapon degradation in, in in Zelda didn't really add, add much. And then there's there's more where you know as Doc has said before, it, get, it just gets samey after a while. Um, yep. And there, there's actually not much depth to the open world overall. Um, you, you know, the only thing there really is to discover after a while is Korok seeds. Um, yeah, I didn't like the Korok seed hunt personally. Yeah, but what was so? What was your other that you're gonna eliminate? The other one that I'm eliminating is a uh, hyper light drifter. Um, I'm eliminating this not because I, I actually like this significantly more than Breath of the Wild. Um, it's actually a very solid, you know, Zelda like game. Uh, I don't have much bad to say about it, other than the fact that uh, Super Mario Odyssey I just think edges it out um, because Super Mario Odyssey is so tightly designed, so. It does a better job of emphasizing exploration than Breath of the Wild, I think, even though it's not like a quote unquote open world, you know, adventure game. It's 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 got levels. It's got, it's got you know, the, the levels are designed in this sort of an open world style. But really, it's more like a almost like a playground, less than a, uh, you know, quote unquote simulation of a world. So more of like a sandbox. Yeah. Sandbox is a better way of putting it. I haven't, pl- I haven't played a Mario Odyssey. So. Yeah. And I've always liked how Super Mario Odyssey encourages you to find ways to beat the levels or find the stars or moons, I guess is what they're called, um, that don't necessarily, uh, aren't the way that the developers like expected or designed into the, into the game. Um, you can, you know, come up with your own solutions to everything and it's, it, it's a lot more like, you know, a classic Mario game or a classic exploration platformer in that sense where, it's just about how you can interact with the game in a in a fun and meaningful way rather than a you know here's here's your prescribed path forward through the game and there you go so interesting cool i'm really looking forward to playing it i hear nothing but good things honestly about mario yeah. odyssey it is great yeah. just haven't had a chance yet it may very well be your game of the year for 2018 it might be <laughs> it might be Jim's game of the year near automata 
my category is uh, the game that impacted me the most. I was able to um, carry carry it with me the longest, um, and that would be uh, Near Automata. And the reason that I'm choosing this game is because when I played it the first time through, I was completely absorbed. I could not do anything but play this game. Every time I came home, and this is this is rare for me nowadays. Every time I came home, that was the but it was what I wanted to do with my free time was play more of the game. And I got drawn into the world because of the um, the deep sense of, of philosophy throughout the game. This concept of, you know, what does it mean to exist? What does it mean to live? What is life about? What is death about? Um, you know, what is choice? What is free will was a big part of the game. And also, I loved the combat system. I thought it was excellent. I thought that uh, the RPG elements were actually well um, implemented. I felt the game struck a good balance between strategy and action. Um, and the difficulty because of it was actually sort of hit that sweet spot where I was able to have a challenge and, and feel like I was being maximally challenged and yet still feel like I was in the zone and not, and not fail. So it was like one of those like perfect, perfect for me, perfect level of challenges when I was mm-hmm. playing on the difficult mode um, and was able to you know, build my character in such a way that suited my play style. And that's what they let you do. You know, I was able to build a character that I could, um, every hit that I, that I would hit, do on an enemy, I would sort of take health back based on my attacks. And so I had this character built where if I just stood there, I could die pretty easily. But as long as I was attacking and as long as I was dealing damage, I, it would be, I was very difficult to kill. So, and that was the way I liked to play because it encouraged me to be more aggressive in my play style. Um, the music, I feel like, uh, near near automata and i'm a little surprised that nick hasn't played it or talked a little bit about it being the music guy but i, felt, I haven't played it yet so yeah. i have nothing to say uh but i feel like i feel like the soundtrack at the very least even if you dislike the game the soundtrack is a masterpiece mm-hmm. it is one of the absolute uh best soundtracks ever in video games and i say that unequivocally without any sort of caveat it's excellent um and the ending for the game the endings many of them had uh, were very either they were all typically sad a lot of a lot of what happens you know sad playing and at best it was it was um bittersweet and but the actual the the final the true ending which i've talked about before and i will not spoil it for chris um you may have heard while doing the editing mm-hmm. some yeah. of it but um i i was so overwhelmed blown away by by the ending that i came in to talk about it on one episode and basically just gushed for probably 15 minutes a lot of which i asked to be cut out Mm -hmm. because i i was in i was borderline incoherent i couldn't even form into words how deeply it affected me and that's why it had to be my game of the year Mm. um it to me it sort of restored my faith in gamers and my faith in gaming and it actually despite the game being extremely like very cynical and dark um it actually put me in a positive mood it made me look positively at um, life and the world and the video game industry for a period of time that I, I feel like just just for that, it deserves recognition. And so for me, that is my personal game of the year, Nier, Nier Automata. Doc's Game of the Year. Rhyme. Okay, so that's actually a complete lie because I don't like the terminology, uh, but that's just me. Would you uh, say that he's been drinking the Kool-Aid? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Dogs, game of the year, asterisk, rhyme. <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't. I don't want to break things here, but uh, basically, I would argue, and I have argued, that a game of the year is something that, if I were to walk up to the shelf and I were to see game of the year edition game, um, that that would be something I'd be like, ah, yes, I can see why they they put all the DLC in there and they're selling it all as, as one thing. And to me, at least with my three criteria games here, Breath of the Wild, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Rhyme. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn is the game that I definitely anticipated the most out of all of those. Um, and it is the one that I think benefited the most from DLC. Um, so if I were to see a Game of the Year edition of Horizon Zero Dawn, that would not upset me. If I saw a Game of the Year edition of Breath of the Wild, however, I would be like, oh, come on, guys. There's just not that much content in your DLC. I'm sorry. It did not fundamentally change the game in any way. There's no new story arc. 
that's just kind of a money grab. There's a, there's a new DLC that adds a new story arc. Well, there is now, but the the point is that uh, stop contradicting me. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, when when did that come out? Uh, late last year, like literally like, like November the end of, or something. End of okay, December. I had no idea because I abandoned that game back in uh, October ish. Mm. Uh, got to Ganon's Castle and was like, I really don't care. Uh, I'm just not emotionally invested in in saving the princess at this point. Mm. I was supposed to recover all of those memories and stuff, and I was like, I can't really. I don't want to find them, and I did. Eh. Yeah, and I, I will say that even the new story DLC, like as as far as I've gotten through it, it's pretty samey. It's really? just adding more See? dungeons so far. For, so for those far. that want to send hate mail, just bear in mind that I, I did love Breath of the Wild. So <laughs> please direct your hate mail to uh, Nick Kruger to, and Doc Brown. To be fair, <laughs> and that's woke Jim. <laughs> send it to, to be fair, Jim. Woke Jim. Breath of the Wild was still in my top three. Like yeah. it was an amazing game, uh, and mm. it's in my top three too. But what I'm saying is, if they released a disc that was, hey, it's got all the things. I'd be like, eh, whatever you say, guys. So for me, uh, I could see making an argument, okay, that there's a difference between your favorite game, your most fun game, your most anticipated game, and what would be marketed as a game of the year edition, okay? So I'm being very precise in this. So in a way, you're almost saying it's like best value. Yeah. Um, Or or like objectively like the, oh yeah that deserves game of the year because yeah. it's yeah it's got all of this going so for like it. even if i didn't enjoy a game i i if if sort of looking at it from the outside and going yes the community has agreed that this is the game of the year the problem is every entity that has game reviews has its own game of the year which is actually one of the reasons why we don't do that we well, you know we don't have a backward compatible game of the year because we we look at it from an individual standpoint because we all have opinions um so for me nobody else has opinions no one has opinions no value opinions at all um no. no, that's pretty accurate with some of those sides. <laughs> for, for me, honestly, I think that from a market standpoint, even though I personally was disappointed and I felt like overleveling was a problem, with a little bit of tweaking, Horizon Zero Dawn could and should be a game of the year, to use that term. However, for me personally, I had more enjoyment on a smaller scale. I did not spend more time with it, but I, I felt like the time I spent on it was richer, fuller, and more fulfilled with Rhyme other than anything else. A little boy washes up on an island. He has to figure out what's going on. It's a puzzle adventure. It gave all the right notes, and it was short. And I wanted it to be short. I did not crave more. Well, that's not true. Technically, I did. I craved more, but I was okay with not having it because it knew what it was. It's like from a, a good slice of pizza. <laughs> you know, that's a really great point. You eat three pizzas, you're like, why did I do that? <laughs> you know? And that's exactly what was going on with Rhyme. So for me, personally, my top game... Not my game of the year, but my top game is Rhyme. Chris's Game of the Year. Persona 5. Oh my gosh, I did not see that coming. So surprising no one. (laughs) My my game of the year is Persona 5. Um, It's funny because I think in in my experience and in talking to people, it almost seems like kind of your first Persona is like the most special in a certain way. Um, The first time you experience Persona, um, you kind of get this feeling that it's hard to replicate in the other ones, even though they come close. Like your first kiss. (laughs) I wasn't going there. But... You know, some friends of mine have talked about how Persona 3 is the best one, or some people have talked about how Persona 4 is the best one, etc. And for me, Persona 4 created this feeling because it was my first one that I couldn't quite get to in Persona 5. But again, it did come very, very close. Um, I thought 5 did some really interesting things with the series. It actually, I think, improved the gameplay of the series quite a bit. Um, while I did have a few qualms with the, uh, you know, you look tired, you should go to bed thing, Um I had a lot more fun going through the dungeons this one uh, than I did in Persona 4 uh, by, like, no no comparison. Uh, I wouldn't mind re-experiencing 4, but if I had to choose one to replay, it'd be Persona 5. Um, and just beyond that, I think it was just a really objectively good game. I thought the uh, mechanics were good. Um, the story I thought was excellent. The music was great. Um, the style, the art, everything, I think just it all came together in this very sort of cohesive, well-thought-out, well-designed game. Um, I just had a lot of fun with it. So it's a, it's a really stylistic game. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I agree with you on that. It, it Everything about it contributed to that style, yes. which you got to give it a lot of points for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was one of those where it's kind of like um, – 
master planned might be a good sort of term for it because it, everything in the game you can really just feel was pointing toward a very specific objective everything uh plays off of other systems it was well it was well executed yeah. we talked a little bit about that earlier and mm-hmm. it was some games are just you know well executed mm-hmm. they have an idea they have a goal mm-hmm. and, and every everything. aspect every feature mm-hmm. it all contributes to it like some games are a little more slapdash or that's probably the best it sounds like a negative term some <laughs> some games are more um they lose focus and they do they try to do a lot of things and they maybe try to do a little bit too much and sometimes it still works because everything in the game is still yep. really good but it may not feel as cohesive so in this case it, it so what so, you're saying right is that mm-hmm. persona 4 i mean and, and persona 5 i'm sorry mm-hmm. and i agree with you it felt very cohesive yes. and it wasn't my first persona game by the way mm-hmm. um but it's my favorite persona game mm-hmm. for that reason i feel like it was more um, what i'm hearing you say is there's a difference between a tight design and a good execution yes yeah, I completely agree with that. Yes. In mm-hmm. fact, I would argue that that was one of the problems with Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm. And so just for fun now, we're going to go in and go around, and uh, each person will remind us of their criteria, and we'll each name what our personal game of the year would be if we were using that same criteria. So, Nick. For, for objectively best, it was uh, Super Mario Odyssey. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so my criteria was the one that, that had the most lasting impact on me, or emotional impact, I should specify. Um, and... That was uh, near Automata. And for my criteria, mostly it was, uh, what did I enjoy as the most fun tight experience? And for me, it was, which game did I enjoy the most that is also objectively good? Uh, so, Nick, what are, what are your um, game of the year in our three different categories? Okay, so for most impactful, I'm going to have to say um, Hyper Light Drifter. Uh, its story was very subtle. There's no dialogue in the game whatsoever, except for, I think, like maybe some... Or there's, I don't think there's like no text in the in the game whatsoever, except for some tutorial pop ups here and there. But I I don't quite remember. But the story that was there was very uh, very interesting. Um, it seemed it was about the the drifter, the, your main character, contracting some sort of disease with the uh, with the arrival of these um, ancient behemoth like giant robots, basically coming to destroy this world. Um, and it's, it's both like a really big, like large scale story, but it's also a very, um, personal story for the, for the main character. Um, and I think it really nails the tone really well. Um, so for, for Doc's criteria of the most tight, small, fun experience, uh, probably got to go with Planet Coaster, um, even though it's you know a game that you can sink hundreds of hours into because it's a tycoon game, it's very um, you know concisely designed. It knows what it's doing. Uh, it, it knows what it is, I should say, and it isn't trying to get too ambitious. So I like I like that a game a lot. And then the game that I enjoyed the most, um, again, Super Mario Odyssey. Jim. Um, so for the objectively best, I'm going to go with uh, Breath of the Wild. Um, I'm gonna have to, I disagree with both Doc and Nick on some of their criticisms of the game. I actually thought that it was um, very well executed, and I felt that the exploration aspects of the game were very strong for an open-world game. Um, I actually found Daggerfall, when I went back to try to play it, extremely bland. Um, and I felt the world-building in, in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was um, excellent. I felt it had just enough story for my tastes for The Legend of Zelda. Uh, bearing in mind that one of my most beloved Zelda games is the very first Zelda, and um, another that I loved a lot, Link's Awakening, had minimal storytelling in comparison to some of the later Zelda games. So for me, Breath of the Wild kind of hit that sweet spot, um, and I felt that it had a massive amount of content, and it was able to manage that content better than the other games on my list. Um, Whereas I could easily point out design flaws in Nier Automata, despite the fact I love that game, um, I don't think, for me at least, it is as easy to do that with Breath of the Wild. Um, any complaints tend to be more on a personal level, not on an objective level. That's why I pick Breath of the Wild um, as the objective best. Um, Doc, you're tight, Ryan was, Ryan was indie. Sure. It was short. It knew what it was. Short it knew what it was. Stray. I like that. Yeah. Let's do that. I'm going to go with that. And I'm going to say, with that criteria, I'm going to pick Cuphead. Sure. Yeah. And the reasoning being that I feel like um, every choice in the game felt um, intentional. Um, everything in the game contributed. I felt it was a very tight, tightly tight experience. I haven't beaten the game yet. However, 
Um, I, I've, I've gotten uh, far-ish in it. There's not a lot of hours in the game in terms of if you just beat everything instantly. The challenge is more that, I mean, the length is more from the difficulty, so it's a shorter experience. It's a more um, contained experience, and I feel like it has a closer relationship to the reason why you picked Rhyme. Mm -hmm. um, and I do feel like it's also a very solid game, a well, very well-made game. Um, and for Chris's suggest uh, topic, or criteria, I should say, which is just the one I had most fun with. Is that the kind of the... Yeah, enjoyed the most. Okay. Um, for that one, only because I want to pick a different game, um, I might pick Nier Automata for that, that category as well, but because I'm trying to just diversify and pick other games, <laughs> I'm actually going to go with uh, Yakuza Kiwami. Mm. And the reason being, um, I absolutely loved a lot of the side quests in that game. They were very fun. And I also loved the sort of like dark drama you know gangster or gangster drama element to it uh in the storyline and um i just had a ton of fun doing some of the just weird quests that you have to do in that game um and yeah i mean it's 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 it was fun just the weird zany mix of like this this off the wall offbeat humor and dark mafia drama like the, just the, just even saying that out loud it just seems so weird but also so cool um so I'll, I'll go with that one as my game of the year with the fun category so i had the most fun playing horizon zero dawn uh i don't complain about games and, and hate on games if i didn't have fun with them or want to have fun with them um, i just i don't get that technical over uh, games that I don't love first, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. my, my, my heavy criticisms of, for example, uh, Fallout come from that deep love of Fallout. And I, and I fell in love with Horizon Zero Dawn as a game, even before it came out. Mm -hmm. And then as it was out, I had so much fun playing that game. So subjectively, that's got to be, um, you know, my, my favorite, if you will, of the games I played this year. Um, however, overall, it, especially when you compare them on the things that they have in, in in common, I think Breath of the Wild is in many ways a far superior game, and objectively, I would say that it's a better game. Um, however, to look at it in terms of which game impacted me the most, stuck with me, that kind of a thing, um, I'm actually going to pull from my more honorable mention list here and go Lego Worlds. Mm -hmm. Because even though I had a deeply frustrating moment with Lego Worlds, uh, which I haven't talked about yet, I will talk about that in a future episode. Uh, man, that is one of the few games that has taken me into a headspace. Let's, let's call it almost like um, an, an, an addict's uh, crazy land. <laughs> uh, it, I, it's been a long time since I have looked up and gone, oh my gosh, it's four in the morning. <laughs> I just, I mean, I'm an adult. I, I don't do that anymore. Uh, you know, I have, I have a small son who relies on me to get up early in the morning with him. <laughs> and I got two hours of sleep that night, the two days after Christmas, because I played that game and went, whoa, mm -hmm. what just happened? Um, it took me into this altered state of thinking. It changed my brain chemistry. <laughs> and so in that sense, <laughs> uh, yeah, quite literally. Uh, and, and I mean, it was, it was hitting the dopamine levels to, to new heights, man. I had more fun exploring uh, the Lego worlds than I have in any game, probably since Minecraft came out. And that is a terrible comparison because they are nothing alike. Hmm. I mean, they look like they should be, but they are First not, 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 seems like yeah. And that's what I thought yeah. too. And the fact that it wasn't just literally took me in and I'm just like, I can get in a spaceship and I can go to another world made out of Lego. I got to do that right now, but I haven't explored all this, but I got to explore all this, but I got to go to the next thing, but I need more, I need more <laughs> bricks. And I, head explodes, right? <laughs> uh, and that's, that's what happened to me for like a week of my life. And I, I don't, I don't want it back and I don't regret it. It was just crazy. So, um, yeah, not my top three for reasons I have not yet discussed, but, um, that based on Jim's criteria, <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> so, uh, if I'm going on Nick's criteria, which is objectively best, um, that one's really tough between, uh, Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey. Yeah. Um, I think if I had to give one an edge, I'd probably give it to Breath of the Wild just because um, I was really impressed by how they sort of reinvented the franchise. Mm. Um, 
whereas Super Mario Odyssey, while it is really great and it did do some innovative stuff as well, I felt like Breath of the Wild did more stuff really well, if that makes sense, like quanti- quantity wise. Um, like they did, a, they have a lot of interesting things you can do with that game, and they do it well. Uh, whereas Super Mario Odyssey is a very sort of tight and good, well designed experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I had to pick one, uh, and really tough decision, I'd have to go with Breath of the Wild for that. Uh, with gems for something that impacted me the most, that one's tricky <laughs> because um, I haven't gone far enough in near to have that same impact that you've had, even though I've really been enjoying it so far. Um, oh, I don't blame you. You're just at the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. Um, and Persona Five, while it did impact me. I don't know if I would make that. Like, I wouldn't say that that's the the way it strikes me as a game that impacted me. Um, and so, one that I actually didn't mention in any of my honorable mentions or anything like that was um, Steins Gate Zero. Um, and this is something that oh, I mentioned. Hot, hot dog in a microwave, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> banana. Uh, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, there banana, go. Yes, banana, banana in the microwave. <laughs> um, this one, I, I mentioned the first Steins Gate last year as one of my contenders for Game of the Year, and this one is actually a sequel that was released in the U.S. first time this past year, um, and it wasn't as good as the first, but it definitely had some highlight moments that um, really have great emotional payoffs from the first um, game in the series. And so for that reason alone, even though it wasn't overall a super impressive experience, there were a few highlights that I think made it the most impactful in that sense. Uh, and then for Doc's criteria of like kind of a tight, fun experience, uh, I'm actually going to go with another one I didn't mention in my honorable mentions, but... Um, Battle Chef Brigade um, was a really fun, again, Doc, you know, you sort of mentioned like sort of indie, small, like oh, yeah. just enough of it. Um, really great experience in that regard. Um, I basically blazed through that within the course of a week and had a ton of fun with it. So um, by that criteria, that'd probably be my game of the year. So I would also like to uh, throw out another um, category for us to consider. What game that came out this year do you think is the most important or mm-hmm. the most influential or innovative moving forward? Huh. For instance, my example would be Breath of the Wild, mm-hmm. just because it, um, despite all of the criticisms I have of it, uh, especially as a fan of open world action adventure games like that, um, ultimately it is going to influence many games like mm-hmm. it. And I actually do look forward to see what uh, Nintendo does with the Zelda franchise after mm-hmm. this, because yeah, I mean, we've even talked about how, in a lot of ways, Super Mario Odyssey borrowed some of the same philosophy of Breath right. of the Wild. Right. Um, I think I would probably agree with that. Actually, if I had to pick one game that was the quote unquote most important of this year, um, I'd probably say that. Mm. For me, if we're talking the most influential and the one that will have the most effect on games later on, I have to also go with Breath of the Wild. Mm-hmm. Um, not just for what it did, but you also have to consider when you're talking about influence, how widespread its effect was. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about a game that sold as many copies as as Breath of the Wild and got as much uh, attention in the press and from um, consumers Mm -hmm. in terms of like sales and the number of people talking about it, I don't know how you can pick any, any, any game besides Breath of the yeah. Wild, if you're being, if you're, if you're being honest exactly. with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If instead you mean the most, because he did say innovative at first, if mm-hmm. you're talking about creativity, mm-hmm. I might be tempted to pick uh, Nier Automata, yeah. to be honest. However, yeah. Innovative wasn't maybe the right. best so, choice so of words. That's because I feel like it was a more creative game. However, even though it sold well, it was a million seller, didn't, it sold quite well, mm-hmm. sig- much more than they thought it was going to sell, it is still a niche game. It, right. It's yeah. significantly more niche than Breath of the Wild was. Uh, Breath of the Wild is... Um, probably the most talked about game of the year i can't think of another that was more talked about than breath of the wild so i think it has and then and and of course it was extremely well received so i feel like in terms of influence uh it's, it has to be the answer doc do, do you concur or you well i do but I, I i do think that if um if it had only come out on wii u it would not have been oh I, and, and, and that and that very well <laughs> could be the case however that's not true. It came out on Switch as well. Right. So there you go. It also would have come out <laughs> earlier, probably. Possibly. Possibly so. Yeah. I, I think with, with, for me, my impression, and I've only played it on the Wii U, but I feel like if the only reason that it came out on the Wii U was because Nintendo felt an obligation, because they had promised it would come on the Wii U, to still release it on the Wii U. Um, I'm sure if they, they probably would have preferred to mm-hmm. release it only on the Switch and get people get even more Switch sales. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm glad they released it on the Wii U so that I could experience it before buying a, Wii, a, a Switch. That feels a little bit too like what happened with uh, Twilight Princess. Oh, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 
and I'm all for cl- cross platforming. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that's a great way to do it. But cool. um, I, I do think that a lot of the so called hype over the game had to do with the fact that it's like I can now play Zelda on the go. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing! Never mind that we've actually had lots of Zelda on the go. <laughs> oh, a ton of them. But, but they're not the quite the same. They're not. It's the 3D not, Zelda games on the go. Well, so. actually, they are. We have oh, yeah. both Ocarina, Ocarina of Time, Time and Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Crew's favorite backward compatible episodes of 2017. So now is the part of the episode where we talk about our top episodes of the year from the podcast. And this is just purely subjective. Each of us picked out a few of our top episodes. And uh, if we're going to go back and listen to three episodes from this year, what would those be? What would we recommend to people? Uh, so let's go ahead and start with you, Nick. Nick's nominees are. Episode 92, The Legality of Fan Games and ROM Hacks. It's like that 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 whole um, Odysseus says a uh, ship problem. Like, at what point is he's replacing everything on the ship? At what point does it become a completely different ship? Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's that's what goes on with these ROM hacks is that some of them change a little bit, some of them change a lot, but they're all taking original material and just moving pieces around and trying to figure out a way to make something different. Yeah. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, these, these fan projects are taking something, they're, they're literally just taking nothing but the idea. Literally, they're just taking the licensed material. Mm-hmm. Like, the story, the characters, um, the world. They're taking that and they're making something new with it. Whether it's like a remake or, you know, a sequel or a prequel, it's still something new with it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just... Yeah. Well, I, I'm reminded of the woman who tried to do the amateur restoration to a, a classic 17th century piece of art mm. and ended up um, basically painting a clown face on it. <laughs> you know, this, wow. is, this, this made news um, a couple of years back. And that's, I think, the, the fear. I think the reality of it is that 99.9% of what's going to be created either will never get finished, um, will be kind of mediocre, yeah. or will be not hurting anyone because it's 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 self. What's well, it's recursive basically? It's, right. it's a it's a subculture of fans who are creating stuff for themselves. I found this one very entertaining just because I like the. Uh, the modding community and I like the fan game community and I've always thought that stuff has been super interesting in terms of you know what the copyright situation is between modders and developers or fan games and ROM hacks and whatever so I found that one very interesting episode 95 developer and player stories in open world games I mean, I'm hearing trust is a, is a big issue too, I think trust is a, I think trust is a and, big issue and I think and that's something that I think is a problem with with open world games in general that I think sometimes they're they're so keen on we want players to see all the cool stuff that we made mm-hmm. that oh that's they don't trust true. players to find it. Don't get me wrong, um, Horizon's a beautiful yeah. game, and and I've played every single day since it came out for at least three hours, and I'm like I said, I'm about sixty hours in, mm. and. And, and, I, and I'm going to go home tonight, and I'm going to play it some more. And I'm loving it. So much of the game I'm loving. And I'm loving the story. And I'm loving everything. What I don't like is the way the pieces fit together. Hmm. That's been frustrating for me. Hmm. And so maybe that's a good thing to start um, talking a little bit about. And coming back you know, sort of full circle to the storytelling in open world games and how these pieces fit together. Because I think that what we have to kind of do is treat these open world games as giant environments in which um, there are like living, breathing elements. There are people, there are cultures, there are towns, there are monsters, all this yes. different stuff. Um, and so you almost have to treat it as if you're just exploring you know, a world, as in real life. This one's kind of a given for me. I'm a huge fan of open world games, and it's, you know, I could talk ad nauseum about, you know, player stories, emerging gameplay, um, and kind of the relationship and the between the developer and the player. Episode 105, Urban Legends in Gaming. Blizzard, you know, heard heard about these rumors, obviously, and actually responded. And their response was, there is no call level. <laughs> Every time, there is no call level. <laughs> and um, they act to the point where it became almost a running joke. Uh, of course, this just fed into the rumors. Oh, they're just saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when Diablo 2 came out, Diablo 2 um, actually does have a cow level. <laughs> and the funny part here, and, and, and Blizzard kind of played with the community here, 
Um, they continued to deny. <laughs> Anyone asked, they would always say there is no cow level. Full knowing that they actually had made a cow <laughs> level in Diablo 2, and it took people a little while to find it. Which just it. leads credence to the idea that there actually is one in Diablo 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that was kind of the funny part, because when people started to find the cow level in Diablo 2, and they tried to share it with the community... Well, now it was Nobody kind of believed them. right. It was the boy who cried wolf situation. The boy who cried cow. Yeah, the boy who cried. The, the demon who cried cow. <laughs> right. Growing up as a kid playing video games, you always have these, you know, sorts of mythologies built up around games. Yeah, I feel like we've kind of lost that a little bit in yeah. recent years, and partially because of the internet and like yeah. just the access to. That rumors blasted, and information. blasted internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Just get rid of the internet. <laughs> Turn it off. Turn it off. I almost side with the FCC now. <laughs> if you want another, uh, you want another perspective on why the internet's terrible, just check out Jim's character in season two of Roll with It. Uh, yeah, there you go. He's very anti-internet. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, those are my top three. Awesome, uh, Jim. What are yours? So my top three. Jim's nominees are episode one hundred and six: Conventions of Simulation and Abstraction in Video Games. And to your point about the pacing, you know, say, for example, you know, you don't want to have to heal yourself up uh, over time to get back into the fight in an action game. But say if you're doing a survivalist dungeon crawl where you've got a limited pool of health health that you can't restore unless you make camp. And even then you're sort of skipping over the time, like you do like a little time skip. But say like you make camp and then you take time to eat and heal and that sort of thing. And then your health is full when you get back at it. There's still a little bit of abstraction there. But, you know, it's closer to the real experience because what you're trying to simulate is the dungeon crawl. Right. And or like a game like a survival horror game mm-hmm. where they like to focus on the slower pacing and so for that um typically you're not able to just open up your inventory and eat some food really fast in the middle of a fight they don't necessarily want you to do that it might be a little bit of a slower process mm-hmm. um so so yeah i mean i think the genre is a big part of that and what you're, what sort of game that you're trying to make i thought we had a really great discussion this was our uh, one of our design decision series mm-hmm. um and we talked a lot about um why companies choose to either make a full simulation of a particular feature or aspect within the game or why they might abstract it out or why they might um, omit it entirely, which is one of the mm-hmm. points you had made. I just listened to the show driving up here today, in fact, mm. um, to sort of refresh my memory a bit. I thought we had a, a really great back and forth talk about it. Mm. and um, It's kind of it's foundational a, to game design, too. It, it really, really is. It's like one of the first things you have to really consider. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of the base concept, right after that you have to go, okay, when you're going to apply that concept, what are you going to simulate? What are you going to abstract out? What should we leave out? Mm. Um, these are at the core of, any, of designing any video game. Episode 108, Gamification and Game-Based Learning. And I, I mentioned before, you know, there's kind of the gamification, the pointsification, where people catch on to the buzzword of, like, they want to incorporate game-like elements into their stuff. And sometimes just adding a game-like element can make it that much more interesting. But I think where people kind of miss the mark, and I think the the single thing I think that most people are missing when they're turning something into a game or trying to make it more game-like is the risk of failure. Um, a lot of times people want to kind of like hold the learner's hand through things. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, no, that, that's, a, that's and a very big very, problem, I agree. Very central to a game is giving the player a chance, or the learner in this case, a chance to fail. Right. Um, even if it's as simple as you have to retry this little section again. Um, but when they learn that they have to actually like figure out how to beat this thing, which means learning what it is we need them to learn to get past it, that's when, you know, games can really shine. Yeah. You know, they're learning by doing, they're learning right. by failing sometimes, but, you know, going through the system and mastering the system, and, you know, that's one of the tricky things about gamification is taking content that's not necessarily lending itself to a game, at least not super intuitively, and adapting it into, okay, even if we have to sort of tell them some information, which is like, you know, a trap that's really hard to get out of, at least in the interaction, can we teach them a concept directly or indirectly that kind of will help them with this apply it somehow i really enjoyed this episode because we got to to talk about um something that all of us sort of have a background in in Mm -hmm. some way uh, whether it's um from from teaching video games whether it's from um educational software or for children or whether it's from you know educational software and 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 um developing tools for um, adults um, it's something that all of us have um, a back background knowledge in, and we were able to kind of share that. Yeah, that was a good one. And um, discuss it from different perspectives because it's, it, those are all very different perspectives, even though the purpose, at least in like a broad sense, is the same. Episode 118, Holiday Special 2017. Nick. Yes. Um, the narrator from Fallout 3 says, War, war never blank. 
Oh man, this is. <laughs> oh, how do I get the changes? Yes, that is, that is correct. They will get harder, like right now. Sorry, sorry, Chris. I'm hey. doing these in order. I actually had a great, I had a lot of fun filming that episode. Yeah, um, that was just a good time. It was just fun. I mean, we had a lot of, we had a ton of game shows. All of them had really strict rules that we all stuck to. <laughs> right. Really <laughs> tightly designed tightly, game shows with fair, with fair shows. people, you know, being no, the referee. But 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 in, all, but in all honesty, it was a lot of fun. I thought that. We had some games that um, we should we should totally go back and redo. I thought it was a, a lot of success, and um, it was, I just had a lot of fun. That was the main thing on that one. There wasn't a lot of you know deep discussion, I don't think, but it was fun, and it was it was it's, it's good to have those episodes mixed in with our you know deeper design decision sort of episodes. Doc's nominees are episode ninety three. Roundtable discussion, Final Fantasy 15. And so they have a few of those moments, but it's interesting what you're talking about and where they kind of focus on the wrong thing Mm -hmm. is that's what this story is about. And my biggest and most inherent problem with this game is my inherent problem that I have with open world RPGs anymore. Mm which is that they still try to apply linear storytelling in the same way that like you once did before you had like this open world design to a game that doesn't require Thank that. You. Um, and this game would be a near perfect game to me. It, like take away the combat and things like that, but from the cohesive whole of what it's trying to do, um, if it didn't have the story of the fall of the kingdom and him trying to get it back, because then you don't get all the narrative dissonance of, I should just be playing through this story because yeah. I'm the prince and I should and I my dad died and my fiance is gone and like I have to I have to get the kingdom the, back. The but instead, exactly. Yeah. But instead, I'm going to mm-hmm. go ride chocobos for 15 hours because that's what my friend said he wanted to do. And there's no reason that he should have suggested that mm-hmm. in the first place. Right. Yeah. Um, and so on one hand, it would make the road trip make more sense mm-hmm. um, because then they wouldn't have money; they'd have to build it themselves. Right. You know, there would be all of those things. They'd be on the run, and you'd have the emphasis on what it does well, which is in the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And instead, you end up losing that because not only does Eric here, as I'm playing this, feel bad that I'm not just playing through the story, but this is what's actually fun, Mm -hmm. but then also, it would give them the time to focus on those things. Oh, that was fun. As you might recall, I absolutely hated that game (laughs) for many, many reasons I will not repeat now. Uh, That that game almost made my list, too. yeah, Yeah. But... Uh, I, I think that it's important for us to talk about games that we disliked and why we dislike them. And I think that uh, having our guest Brody on there and being able to talk about it as a roundtable, um, you know, it's so infrequent that we have a roundtable game that we all uh you know d- d- that we don't all at mm-hmm. some have something nice to say about it, and <laughs> I got to say, I just didn't have much nice to say about it, and so I really enjoyed that. Uh, that range of discussion in that particular mm-hmm. episode. It was a lot of fun for me to complain. We need to play some more controversial games. Yeah. He, he had a great, uh, uh, Eric had a great perspective as well. I was, mm-hmm. I was glad to have him on and talk. He about really it. did. And yeah. it's always a treat to have Eric on. Uh, but, uh, and, and he was on the next episode too. So mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, episode 94 mm-hmm. uh, another is, good one. is another great yes. one because of that. Uh, but uh, I, I chose 93 because it, it felt so different for me uh, as one of the co-hosts mm-hmm. to, to really, engage in a little bit of uh, gamer hate. (laughs) (laughs) Episode 96, The Scale of Game Worlds. As soon as you get that mount, you realize how small the map really is, because they used forced perspective to create an illusion of mountains. Now, oh, mild, see, that's, that's too bad. Mild spoiler, I warned you about this yeah. last week. The game is set in Colorado. Oh, okay. Okay? Makes sense. So, uh, whenever you're looking out there, you're looking at actual Pikes Peak. Wait, we're not talking, like, modern Colorado. Like, this is some experiment. No, it's... They're in, they're in like, the Truman Show or something. No, no, know. it's 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 post-apocalyptic. Okay. It's been... post, post-apocalyptic Colorado Springs uh, and Denver. Yeah. Lloyd pulls off a mass as Jim Carrey. The problem is that <laughs> the problem is this: Colorado Springs has twelve buildings. Denver has about twenty-four. It's like they took the map, the aerial map of this valley, yeah. which there's a new mountain range, okay, which is fine. You can have a new mountain range if a thousand years have passed, and it keeps the whole thing in a valley. But in this new valley mountain range, what you have is a city that is massive. I lived in Colorado Springs for a while. It's huge, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you've scaled it down to an insulting size and then built models on top of it that are quote unquote normal buildings. Actually, the feeling that I had walking around in this game, once I figured out the scale, was that I was a 50 foot woman. 
<laughs> I really did. And so you're looking at Pikes Peak, and you're like, wow, it's majestic, and it's glorious, and it's in the distance, and you can walk to it in two minutes, and you can scale it in, in one. Wow. It's tiny, and it's close. That would really break my immersion playing the game. Bingo. This is the one where we talked about scale in open worlds, and I just laid it out for uh, Horizon Zero Dawn being a problem, yeah. a major, yeah. major problem that the game was too small because, and I think it's safe to say at this point, uh, you know, it's set in the Rocky Mountains, which you can climb in three minutes, <laughs> uh, and that just doesn't work. It, just, it, it disrespects a huge portion of American history. Right, exactly. You know how hard it was to get past the Rockies? Look, up, may, maybe if you're just lazy, you, it takes you longer than that. And, and <laughs> I, you know, I'll just briefly point out that in that show, in that episode, uh, I think we hit on something really, really important. I want to say it was Jim that said it, but I won't swear to it. And it's that if it had been a fantasy game, it would have been just fine. Oh, yeah. Because... If it wasn't the Rocky Mountains, They weren't been real fine. mountains. Yeah. And yeah. I think you, you have the exact same thing in, say, Breath of the Wild. Um, and, and I alluded to this a few minutes ago whenever I said those two games put next to each other, Breath of the Wild is a superior game, mm -hmm. ultimately, because um, you've got these fantasy mountains that you go and you climb, and it may take you three minutes to climb those, but that's okay. They're fantasy mountains. They're not Pike's Peak, mm -hmm. specifically. Um, also, ultimately, I think that the... Um, you know, some of the other things that, that happened in, in terms of scale and games and the choices that we make uh, just really came out in that episode. And it was it was brilliant. The bonus compatible was also really fun that's comparing true. the size of game worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's a really, really uh, good one. If you haven't caught that bonus compatible. Yeah, that's worth going and catching. Episode 107 is over leveling a problem. I, I think it's something where it depends on the game that you that you have. So if you're in an open world game um, and you're really are trying to push this, you can explore things and you can do things in any order, which is the case with Breath of, the, Breath of the Wild, you have to allow for the player to be overpowered. You have to, because if they choose to do that, there's nothing that you should be doing to stop them. Essentially. Yep, that makes sense otherwise, to me. Otherwise it, goes, it runs counter to the entire design philosophy of your game. Well, tangential question then. Should you signal through a natural game-like means that this is a thing that could happen? Sure, but I think that they do. Because if, if you get to an area and something is more difficult, you can think, oh, I should go and get a little bit better. Um, if you get to an area and things are very, very easy, you might, that is it also a trigger of, oh, I'm, maybe I should chill out a little bit on looking for shrines and getting more heart containers and getting better equipment and just beat what I have with what I have. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are those those clues. I don't I don't think that the game should tell you flat out, oh, you're getting too good here. Flat out, no. Um, but I think that you also have to be mindful of those clues because um, it's very easy to expect the game to do it for you because a lot of modern games do, in a sense. My last choice was really hard, because between episode 105 and 111, 111, because between episode 105 and 111, I think we had some really strong shows. Mm -hmm. I think if you were to just start listening to 105 and go all the way through to the end of the year, uh, I think you would be very, very happy with the episodes that are there. I know I was. And 107, particularly, where we talked about the over-leveling problem. Uh, oh, that was a great that was, I, a, that was a design decision. Yes. Yes. I think, I think that that is, uh, for us, a really successful series that we've done. I think we need to keep talking about that. Sort of uh, the, these ideas of, of, of important design elements that if you mess it up, it really has a bad effect. You can have this great idea for a game, and uh, you know, like we were saying before, Jim, uh, have it, have a tight design, but you just mess it up with your execution. Um, That's so common in games too. Yeah, it really so is. So the over leveling problem one hundred and seven uh, talks about this idea of should you give the player the freedom to over level? And again, I cited Horizon Zero Dawn, so maybe this is why I like this as my favorite episodes uh, because it was ultimately. I think a top game for me, um, not the top game, but a top game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, also those were the three episodes where I get to complain the loudest. So <laughs> there you go. It's always good when I'm not the only one complaining. It's true. It's true. <laughs> it's usually my role. 
<laughs> so it didn't quite make my top three, but I also wanted to mention very quickly episode 100. Um, that was a really fun one to put together, and it was a fun sort of like look back at the podcast as it's been. That was a great episode. It was. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And there was a lot of, um, of editing work put into that. Mm-hmm. That, yes. was, that really kind of enhanced it. Yep, really I, enhanced it. I'm well aware that there was. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was giving you a shout out. There. I, I appreciate it. That was a multi week project for everybody involved. Um, yeah. Yes, it was. And also, I wanted to take this opportunity to quickly share some interesting stats about this past year um, as compared to 2016. So, um, 2016 consisted of 34 episodes. Um, we had an average. Uh, Episode length of one hour, nine minutes, 18 seconds. Um, shortest episode that year is f- 54 minutes, 20 seconds. And the longest was actually only uh, one hour and 22 minutes, 43 seconds. So that's 2016? That's 2016. Yeah. So 2017, we had fewer episodes. We only had 30 episodes as compared to 34. Uh, however, uh, they were much longer, generally speaking. So our shortest one this year was an hour and nine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then our longest was um, a whopping 229. Uh, almost 2.30. We we're actually only six, uh, six seconds short of that. Oh. And so our average length ended up being about an hour 24, which is about right. A lot of our episodes, especially later in the year, ended up being closer to about an hour and a half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've been trying to shoot for an hour, right? In theory, but I think we've started <laughs> giving up on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's just... Yeah. <laughs> then we let Nick come on and... Uh, I, oh, yeah, our, yeah. Our, new, our new sort of limit is 90 minutes. We try to stay under that, generally mm-hmm. speaking, unless it's a special. Um, and so despite having four fewer episodes, we actually ended up having uh, three, a little over three hours more content uh, this season than we did last season or last year I should say um, we did it for you not that as, as not a comparison guys, in 2016 we had a one day 15 hours and 16 minutes in 2017 we had one day 18 hours and 22 minutes hmm. wow hashtag metrics are fun yay stats Chris's nominees are episode 98 Kisho Tenkets the art of reframing Actually, it, it reminds me of like you know a classical Chinese poem that sort of inspired the structure. Um, I, I can't recite it exactly in different translations. Do it differently, but basically, it talks about it, it sets up the scene of spring flowers, and you can hear the birds chirping and mm-hmm. stuff like that. It kind of gives you this mental image, and then the next panel is and now this storm is crashing down, and then the final point that they may, make is the image of um, you know petals being washed away and stuff like that. And he's wondering how many of the the beautiful flowers survived this storm. So the storm kind of comes in and turns the whole thing on its head. That's the twist. Mm-hmm. The twist totally recontextualizes and everything. To be to be to relate this to what we talked about earlier with with the story in Near, mm-hmm. that's what happens in Route C. Mm-hmm. It recontextualizes the whole story that you play through in the first two routes and turns everything on its head and mm-hmm. gives you this great twist and now things kind of go in this different direction yet there's this relationship with the first part mm-hmm. that's kind of also added back in later on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so then by the time you get to the end you're looking at the entire piece. Exactly. Definitely. And then it then yeah and then it sort of that actually, changes your perspective. Yeah, that that frames everything that you said mm-hmm. and and clears it all up for me, Jim. This is a really interesting one because we got to explore um I I'm always really a big fan of like exploring story structures and um narrative structures that sort of thing and Kisho Tenkets is one that um, when you sort of get it a little bit, you can understand some of the differences between Western culture and Eastern culture in terms of storytelling. Um, it was also interesting to look at uh, how that might inform different uh, game design philosophies. Super Mario 3D World, as an example, um, really took Keisha Tenkets as a uh, framework for how they design their levels, the four stages of... Um, I mean, most 3D Mario games up until Odyssey kind of have that same mm-hmm. that framework as well. For sure. Um and so that was uh, it was interesting to talk about whether from a game design perspective and from just kind of a cultural and storytelling, like sort of broad media perspective. So that was a lot of fun. And then my next couple actually, Doc, are in the sort of string of really great episodes toward the end of the year. Episode 114, Randomization in Game Systems Design. Probably like the biggest single takeaway if there is one, and this is not to close the discussion, no. but to say that, you know, player choice is a super important thing in games. Yes. Player skill specifically, and this is something that um, I've talked many, many times before about the theory of fun for game design mm-hmm. by Raf Koster. And one of the things he talks about Boy, is... have you ever. Yes. Uh, one of the things he talks about, and other game designers talk about this too, he's not the only one, uh, the importance of skill in a game. Yes. A game needs to require player skill, and it doesn't matter if the skill is, like, depending on the game, it might be something mechanical Mm -hmm. do i have the dexterity to be able to do this properly yes uh or strategic it could be do i have the right decision making well and that gets into player skill versus character skill but Mm -hmm. that's a whole separate thing Mm -hmm. and so if you have a game with too much randomization 
what tends to be happening is you're adding more and more chances for the player's skill to be either canceled out yeah. or to be uh, invalidated yeah. or even just removed entirely. That was another one that uh, kind of like Jim, we were talking about the um, abstraction simulation. Um, that being a sort of very foundational part of game design. This yeah. is another one where we got to really take a deep dive into how introducing randomness to games and game systems um, can affect the way you're approaching your game design and the way that it works. Episode 117, Evoking Specific Emotions in Tabletop RPGs. And so the stats that you have, too, I think also tie into those mechanics and tell you what it is that you can roll for. And kind of going back to randomization sure. talk that we had a few episodes ago, um, asking yourself... Basically, and it's not always rolling, granted, but like we're just going to use rolling as the broad term for randomization, deciding what happens. What are you rolling for and why? Um, and so even in something like Dungeons and Dragons, there's the charisma stats. The, the presence of the charisma stat tells you that there are situations in which your charisma and your ability to talk to people is going to become important. Right. Um, if you have a game that doesn't have a charisma stat, if you choose to include it, it's because the players decide to include it. Uh, and so the game's going to steer you away naturally from mm -hmm. charisma because the stuff that the game is trying to direct you toward or um, to kind of move a little bit into like feedback loops. Mm -hmm. um, when I roll this stat and I'm successful, these things happen. When I'm unsuccessful, these things happen. And that affects the trajectory of the story. The way that you balance that, the types of stats you use when you roll, why you roll, et cetera, et cetera, all kind of point you toward here's the experience the players have and what it's going to encourage them or discourage them to do. Another one that's just near and dear to my heart because uh, we're our tabletop RPGs designers. And so it was fun to talk about um, how these games, how you can basically create these feelings in players or create these experiences for players through your design decisions. And so I, we've kind of I've been sensing a theme here as we've been talking about this. A lot of our best episodes are the ones that are kind of drilling down on um, how and why he designed games certain ways. And so that is just something I agree that we should keep talking about in the future because having an understanding of that helps both with making games but also with understanding, being able to critique games, being able to look at them critically and say, um, if I'm liking this, why? If I'm not liking this, why not? Um, which is kind of the core philosophy of our podcast and get down to it. Nick's favorite episode of 2017. Episode 95, Developer and Player Stories in Open World Games. And that leads back into the main topic at hand, which is that when you're storytelling in an open world, you, you, are you going to design your world around the story or are you going to design your story in that world? You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yes. And there's a right. big right. difference. And that's, yeah, exactly. Like we said, I mean, you, you establish the rules of the world, make sure they're consistent, give, give player the tools that they need, to seek out those parts of the world, mm -hmm. to explore the world, and your job's practically done. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you can get that part right, you've made a good. You've al you've already practically made a good game. Sure, you got to figure out that little pesky part of, you know, how's the player going to control? You know, what like for example, combat is mm -hmm. a whole system, obviously, but it, it, for games that have combat, but you're almost there. You've almost you almost have made a good game just off, right off the bat if you can get those rules right. That's right. Because everything else kind of falls into place. That's you know, right. if, you also if have the rules to, work, you also the have to, has to abide by those rules and, too. And you have to nail the player motivation. Yes. And oh, what's, yeah. What's interesting oh, yeah. is like, you know, we can sort of compare a lot of the things like, well, this game and this game kind of do it the same way. But then when you think about what doing that thing means in the context of those respective games, yeah. Zelda is kind of like intrinsically motivating. It sounds to me like Horizon is a little bit more extrinsically motivating. Yeah, it really is. And That's a good way to put it. They're trying to get give you the, the like here's yeah. why you should want to do this jim's favorite episode of 2017 episode 118 holiday special 2017 doc and chris elderly cricket encounter go so of course everyone has heard of a cricket in times square the classic children's novel this is a story about uh that same cricket as an older cricket uh, no longer in Times Square. And so you were reflecting on um, 
it, it's a little bit like that Sherlock Holmes movie, Mr. Holmes, that came out. It's it's that same cricket in its elder years. Right, right. And um, <laughs> you're sort of exploring the parts of its past, maybe it regrets. Um, it's a very sort of existentialist sort of um, looking back on the old days while still having um, some degree of potency. Like, how has aged both improved and um, hindered the cricket? Right. And so it's actually told in flashback. And each, uh, let's call it scene, then impacts the world around you in the present. And so what you do is you end up uh, problem solving or puzzle solving, helping people out. And then whenever you come back into the present world, you have these these memorabilia artifacts um, and how the world has changed from your actions. And of course, the encounter part is important too, because what's going to happen is there's a branching narrative where depending on how you interact with the cricket, both uh, changing the past to get to, to, your, to your present, but then the way you react, the way you interact with the cricket is going to determine what becomes of the cricket. Um, does the cricket uh, sort of like revel in its elder years? or in its, in its later days, or is the cricket going to sort of fall into a sort of depression? Right. And so it's really important to understand that seconds. everything is emergent. Um, as you're playing this, the, the story is actually going to be reacting to you, not just as the player, but as the storyteller. And so, um, you know, cricket is not just the character, but it's actually an extended metaphor. <laughs> For life. And it's iconic, too, because we've all heard the sounds of cricket at, at night. Um, right, and just right. like uh, cricket in Times Square, it, it's bringing the natural world into our urban bustle. Yes. Ultimately, it becomes a, a grand metaphor for death. And that was the pitch for... <laughs> oh, my God. Wow, that was crazy. Thought... So that was, the, that was the pitch for elderly cricket encounter. <laughs> so I beat that, suckers. Well, Doc's favorite episode of 2017. Episode 96, The Scale of Game Worlds. And I guess what we're really talking about here is how much compression is too much compression. And I am arguing that Horizon Zero Dawn went too far with its compression. Yeah. Basically, if it had been about twice the size or even four times the size, I think it would have been fine. If it had been 12 times the size, it would have been too big. Yeah. I'm not arguing for a one-to-one. I never argue for a one-to-one. No. Okay? And people here, have been saying that about GTA for a while, talking about why can't, why is the city of, of L.A. not bigger? Why, does, why are they... Making, and it's because they're it's, ignorant. It, honestly, right. if, if I... If I walk from my house down to the coffee uh, uh, store, right, the coffee shop that's down on the corner uh, next to the game store and the comic book store, uh, this is my frame of reference for everything. Mm -hmm. It takes me 15 minutes to get there and then 15 minutes to get back. Right. If I'm playing a game and it takes me more than two to three minutes to get to a place, that's too long. Yeah. That's way too long. So what? What? that example right there is a one to five Compression, right? Mm-hmm. Three divided by fifteen divided by three is five. Anyway, math um, is hard. Numbers, numbers, yeah. math, math, math. <laughs> okay, so so what I'm really saying here is compression is good. It's a very good thing, and there is an art to making that mountain look like a big mountain that is there and far away when it's really small and close. The problem comes whenever I can then go to that mountain and climb that mountain and also recognize that it is literal Pike's Peak. Chris's favorite episode of 2017. Episode 114, Randomization and Game Systems Design. And that's an interesting case of the system and the mechanics informing the meta, basically. Exactly I'm sure they designed right. that around, they, they designed that probably, at least to some extent, intentionally yes. to get a certain type of game. Very play. much so. They, they are expecting the scenario to be very frequently that the orcs charge and the yes. space mode them down. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what's interesting about sort of, let's call it the Age of Sigmar design mm-hmm. uh, that has come lately. It's getting us away from the simulationist aspect mm-hmm. of this particular bullet is represented by this particular die right. and now this die represents your armor and it but what's interesting is even different. even the most simulationist of games uh, is still abstracting the real the reality of course it is because when you get down to it there is no such thing as randomness no um everything has cause and effect. Right. Um, this is just physical, scientific fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if we wanted to, we could go through and talk about um, the gun, when the trigger was pulled, was pointed in this direction, uh, wind was this, air resistance was this, mm-hmm. go on and on and on. The bullet is going to hit this point at this time. Uh, and oh, now have... you're talking about Mech Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, like, you know, if it, hits the, if it hits the target, because it was aimed at the target, the target right. was in the trajectory, uh, it's going to hit this part of the body, it's 
it's going to do exactly this much damage. Uh-huh. Um, it's going to kill them or wound them, as the case might be, or right. it's going to kill them later. All this stuff is very deterministic, but we abstract it because we don't have the time to sit down and do advanced physics for, right. for every gunshot. <laughs> and I think we can all agree that the best episode of the year overall was episode 115, Games as a Service. Back in, <laughs> uh, our, our wonderful Thanksgiving special where we talked about uh, Battlefront 2. So I like around what you're saying. Like yeah. Oh, yeah, things got a little bit heated. Actually, I totally <laughs> forgot that was my game of the year. I uh, forgot to... Battlefront <laughs> 2. <laughs> that was... I actually almost included that, but then I went back and I started looking at our catalog and how rich it was. Oh, yeah. I go, yeah, yeah. I go you know, I enjoyed that episode and I thought we had a good, uh, some good discussions. The heat and <laughs> nature of it aside, but that's yeah. always part of the show. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, kind of, it's kind of fun. You know, it's all in, it's all in jest. We're all friends here. But um, well, I, I, mean. I say after blowing up at people all the time, right? <laughs> um, no, but, uh, but then I started looking back at our catalog and I'm like, okay, I, I thought this was a good episode, but we have – in comparison, mm-hmm. yeah. it was one of actually one of our weaker episodes. Mm-hmm. I, agree. I felt so. You know, we had a really, I think, a really strong year. Um, I would, I would say, this is um, our strongest year yet. I know, a bold statement, maybe, <laughs> but I feel like we're, I feel like we're getting better every year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't want to talk ourselves up too much, but mm-hmm. I, I do feel that um, we have some, we have some good content to go back and look at and examine. We have some things to look at next year, and hopefully, we'll be able to produce even better content. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we want to thank you, dear listeners, for joining us for this past year of uh, good backward compatible content, or at least what we think is good. Um, <laughs> feel free to write into us, too, and let us know what your favorite episodes of the year were. If there were any, um, even not necessarily episodes, but favorite moments you might have had, let us know. Um, it helps us to kind of know what we ought to keep doing. Um, and also just to kind of get a sense of what it is that you guys enjoy. I think it'd be fun to hear what some of the fans um, thought were the best episodes. Yeah, both of you. <laughs> That's uh, archetypally speaking, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, everyone, for episode 119 of the backward-compatible.com podcast, our year in review 2017. I'm Chris. I'm Nick. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next year. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. Wait, isn't it already next year? It is already next year, but it's, I don't know. We'll, see, already, we'll, we'll see you in the we'll, coming year. We'll see you this year. We're we'll see you in the future. Well, again, we're talking to our 2016 listeners here, so. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah,